day of Odin's Day. Today is June the 2nd. Yes, a wonderful day for Odin's Day, which is a stream. And we're doing some, again, delightful things on this stream, maybe. Um, but yes, we're doing some stuff. So I'm going to wait for people to come. I'm posting this to all of the appropriate sites so that um, I can do everything necessary, of course. So let me just place it into every single link. And here we go. So here we go. We've got the stream, stream, stream. And welcome aboard, everybody, to the wonderful world of, that is, Odin. So hopefully this is streaming and people are watching. Um, right. <clears throat> okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Finally. Yeah, sorry I'm a little bit later than normal. I'm usually starting at 10 o'clock. I'm starting at quarter past today because just, to be honest with you, I can forget what the time was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that normally happens sometimes. But yeah, that's fine. Yes. Okay. So tonight's stream is going to be two little bits to it. One of them is talking about the new release of Odin, which happened yesterday. And then the second one will be, um, second aspect will be sort of something else. Um, oh, have you? Okay. That's a very good point. Yeah. You said Ginger Bill went live, so you may have to switch that. Yeah. I, I recommend maybe switching to that one because Ginger Bill sounds like a really cool chap. So, yeah. Yeah, I am live. Wait, wait a minute. I'm Ginger Bell. Who'd have thunk? But that's the right word, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first time I'm just going to go open up is. Uh, Finally, oops, I can't even type tonight, which is not a good sign to the start of the stream now, is it? Uh, let's show over to the stream, do a quick transition. And we'll just go to the Odin thing, but yes, we need to go to the latest release, which was yesterday, which is the uh, Dev 2021 06 release. Yes, we do now do monthly things where we make a new monthly build at the beginning of the month. Which means I actually get a, a regular schedule of releases. We're going away from like version 0. Point whatever the things because that was very arbitrary when things happen. And I thought, no, having monthly releases is a much better way of thing of doing things. So let's explain what's happened in the new release. Um, some of the new language features, compiler improvement, pack new packages or packages and changes, and general fixes. So the first of which is the new language features. Um, what and now Odin now allows is the ability that if all of the um, if a union is comparable, as long as all the variants are also comparable. So similar to how a struct, where all the fields in a struct, if they're comparable, the struct is comparable. This now works for unions, but because unions are now comparable, this means that unions can be allowed as map keys as well, which means they are hashable. They'll have the same semantics as it's kind of a struct in the way they hash. So what happens is it will hash the tag in the union first and that whichever variant it is, it will then go hash that. That's how it works. Quite simple. And if it's a, a maybe one and it's a pointer, it doesn't have a tag itself, it will just hash the thing itself directly. That's very useful. Another one is I improved the implicit selector expression inference rules with unions, at least. Um, so what this allows is one that is it's a little bit interesting is though is that a union could have be made of multiple enums, but originally um, the inference rules would only work if it only had one enum. But if it has multiple enums, but all of the names are unique or the name that you want is unique in that entire list, then it will work and figure it out correctly. It works absolutely wonderful in that case. Another one is unification of this logic here. So even though so in Odin, there are technically three ternary expressions, which is annoying, but technically there needs to be two. But 
I've had to settle on having three. So the first one is the, what everyone is used to in C. Uh, this one here is with the if things, which is a runtime one. And if I had a when in there, it would become power time. Um, personally, I prefer this one because it's more Python-like anyway, but it also actually solves a lot of ambiguities um, in parsing, which makes things a bit easier in general. Not, it's actually no diff more difficult than this, but it means you're not using a colon there and not using a uh, thing here. But I prefer this one in general because it kind of says, hey, this is the default if the condition is true, else we're going to use whatever the wire is one. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that, that's what I've done. So this now acts exactly as before because previously it was a bit confusing where the logic was. Um, before it would say, hey, it's, if all of it is constant, then it will evaluate as a constant, like a when expression. But then that's a bit confusing because you can't read it and know when it's going to do that. Uh, another one is improving the type inference. So I'm now allowed, um, you can do at on a compound literal, like uh, take the address of it without having to specify the type in some particular cases when that can be inferred. It, it's very rare, isn't it? It's a very edge casey thing. It also actually, the reason why I implemented this is it was improving the error messages for a lot of things. One thing here is another thing we didn't like language fix is we, someone had a nice little uh, thing in Odin. Um, someone, someone spoke about this and said, uh, there's a bug where if, if you have, for instance, uh, four in on a naught to two five five, and the thing, the value is a, U, uh, is a uh, U8, then this will loop forever because it wraps around. Now, for, I would say, I would say that's not technically a bug because of how Odin defines wrapping behavior in Odin, which is not, wrapping is not a bug in Odin. It's actually, I, I'm just treating everything as two's complement. The issue, and this is an issue, um, is that that's not very intuitive to what people want, especially for a for loop. So how do you get around this possibility? So what I what you do is, luckily, you just do a basic check. You check to see if the vast va the vast value is equal to the, the maximum integer size, preventing it. In many cases, this is a um, the top value may be constant, and if that's the case, it's really easy to do. And most of the time, you're not even using that, you're using the dot dot less than symbol as well. The other one here is a lot, and it just makes things easier. And you can usually do very, very basic optimizations on it to get rid of it as well, so you can do everything correctly. Um, another thing is I'm allowing the dot dot equals alongside the dot dot for full range. And the reason why is I think it's a lot clearer to read what it does rather than dot dot, because again, in many languages, dot dot means different things. And I think in the future, which is what Odin Fumpt will eventually do. We need to make Odin Fumpt really robust. We'll talk about that in a minute, though. Is um, this will be exclusively used for the varied parameters, and then those will be used for the ranges. Should be good. I've removed static from global variables because it doesn't really make any sense in Odin um, because of how uh, transla transla uh, translation units are. Effective unit is one giant one, so being specific about it didn't really make any percent sense, especially since virtually everything is static by default. Um, unless it needs not be. Hey-ho. That's how that works. Um, <clears throat> the other one is I had now a link section to global variables, which means you can then specify where the link sec the, the, the variable itself is in. I'll add it for procedures eventually as well, but I've not had a need for it yet. I bet there's someone out there who wants it, uh, but not yet. And then I've added a bunch of compiler intrinsics, so mem0, mem copy, mem copy, um, non-overlapping, square root, pointer offset, and pointer sub. So I'll explain the, the reasoning behind all of these different intrinsics. So one is mem copy, mem zero. It's very simple. That is literally, you take in a pointer, you say how many bytes it is, and it will zero the data at that value. Um, yes, yeah, so link section as in like dot, yeah, dot data, dot text, dot BSS, or something you completely, um, your uh, custom one as well. Yeah, you could use a different link section. Yeah, that's the whole point. Uh, sorry, the intrinsic so mem0 is very useful, and the reason why it's an intrinsic is because then um, the compiler can take good optimizations and say, hey, we can actually inline this better and do much better inlining when necessary. Similar to what mem copy and mem copy non overlapping. So mem copy in Odin is the same as mem move, and mem copy non overlapping is the same as mem copy. Um, yes, that means we do default to safety by default, the safety thing by default rather than the unsafe thing. But in general, this usually very optimizes down very quickly because if it knows it's not, if they're non-overlapping anyway, um, then it will just go default to the non-overlapping. No, you cannot put an at link on a load yet because it would be on the variable itself, not on the data, which is where it's a little bit annoying. Um, I agree, that's quite annoying. Um, 
I'd have to find a way of doing that with load. Load needs some other parameters in, to be honest with you. It probably needs some default other default parameters on the end, because there's a lot more than people want just that. Um, other things, square root is needed because um, some of uh, the data operations require also square root is an instruction on most things. So it's helpful to have it as an instruction, as an intrinsic, but it's also because um, you don't have to rely on that many other things. Like For instance, when you're doing the um, absolute value effect of a complex number of quaternion, you need to do the square root somewhere. So even though square root is a pretty cheap operation nowadays, um, it's just easier for the compiler can optimize that. Pointer offset and pointer sub is mainly there for, again, optimization purposes, because even though you can implement this manually, uh, this approach does mean that the optimizer can actually figure out things, and it's only for internal use. I wouldn't recommend anyone using them. Uh, they are purely for internal use. Okay, so the new language features and such, uh, let's talk about the compiler improvements. So the compiler now tokenizes plus plus and minus minus as actually tokens, but disallows them in the parser entirely. But this is because then it allows for better error messages for when they're used as operators or statements. Um, I originally thought, okay, I don't want to do this. I'm going to allow. And then I'm thinking in practice, people who are typing this is most likely a bug, even though many people want kind of want um, increment and decrement operators or statements in general. My general view is, yes, I know exactly how useful they are. The problem is defining their behavior is, is a pain in the backside, to be honest with you. And um, yeah, not necessarily got an idea. Another one is verbose errors. I need to actually write stuff on this. What verbose errors does is effectively prints your tells you where your error happened and prints the actual line of it happening in. And it shows you where the error, where range of it happened. It's a nice little thing that many people like. I personally don't like verbose errors, which is why it's not the default. Yes, I know it's my language, but many people do like Rust has them by default, usually like verbose errors. So if people want that, they can. <clears throat> Another one is improving er uh, passing error messages. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to help people with, if there's an error in the old like, text, it will figure out how things get better. It's a general related to the verbose errors, but things in general. Another thing is an experimental feature, which is the use separate modules support. Um, and the whole point of this was to speed up code generation for development builds. Um, what this does is effectively turns each um, package into a different translation unit, code module, whatever thing, a bob. Turns them into different build units. So then, uh, when we generate them in LLVM IR and then pass them to LLVM, they deal LLVM generates them in parallel at once. This is giving me at least, usually about on average, about 40% improvement in compile times. But it's highly experimental because I found a use case when I've used it on a large code base. It crashed the Windows linker. Not LLVM. I crashed Windows linker. Which means I'm like, uh, something's gone wrong here and I don't know what. Um, so either I'm generating something a little bit wrong or... I found a bug in the Windows link, uh, like the MSVC linker. So I'm not sure. So that's why I'm keeping it experimental because it is, I don't know what's going on. Other thing I've done, some minor correct um, system V edge B case, uh, ABI case, edge cases, they are like literal edge cases. They are completely fixed now. Uh, then there is <clears throat> array, I've improved also the array arithmetic code generation. Um, so for a small arrays. So previously, um, certain things like, for instance, if you were doing like, um, had an array arithmetic and you were in plus, plus say, times, e times equals like two, this was actually slower than if you did things in, in incrementally. The reason as to why that was slow is because it was doing it dumb. It was actually doing the, uh, just to show what it was actually doing. If you had, for instance, this is the old behavior, not the current behavior. So we had this and you did this to it. The actual internal code would do so this would actually become used uh, used to become x equals x and then f32 of 222 now you're thinking oh that should be fast shouldn't it here's the issue the optimizer was dumb and think didn't know how to do this so i've improved it so yes it does become this now but the way it optimizes it is a lot easier and a lot cleverer. So before it was just being dumb and doing this, and sometimes it had to allocate memory, and it was oh, it was awful. So just rearranging how the which order the instructions actually happen with means it was generating the code that you expected, as in it would turn it into a SIMD instruction effectively. Um, 
so it was being it was just being dumb So, okay, that was more thing. There's also different packages. For instance, we have Odin Printer, Odin Format. These are going to be used for the Odin Fumpt uh, tooling. Uh, this means you can actually, so Odin Fumpt is a way of you input your Odin code and it will format it correctly for you in a very nice way. This removes a lot of the, all of those stupid um, like formatting debates. And it's like, look, hey, here's a default format. Yes, you can customize it if you want to change like the race styles or if you want to use tab tabs for indentation or some like the amount of spaces or whatever. There'll be a default and that's what I'll will be the default will be the most encouraged one, of course. Uh, but you can always default it to your different code base if necessary. But that's still not robust enough yet. I haven't released Odin Fumpt as its own tool. Um, so, but when that does, you'll be able to do Odin Fumpt and be a brilliant. I mean, you will love it. Uh, doc format is something so we have documentation generation format now which is a binary form which I've defined uh, which is in uh, doc format here which is which is go to the Odin format because it's just as easy to read and the way it's formatting is it defines all of the exported information for those packages and it has a completely like big old graph that does everything it's a very simple format so for instance if you have your um, the data format it's very this is the entire header by the way is the entire specification effectively and that's 256 lines, including space. It's about 200 lines, really, if you exclude space. Um, it has all the different stuff in it. So here's the header. It says all the files, the packages, the entities, and the types. Um, pretty simple. So you have all the files and the packages. You can just iterate through them there. And all the packages, by the way, have lists of all the files, which are indices to the file index, and have all in in indexes to all the entities. It has the full name, the path, all the flags on the thing, like is it built in, runtime, or init. Um, and it has documentation, which is just jet drawn a string for that package. Um, files are very basic. They have a package index, which is referring to it, and the name. So you can all look, it's all hype, hyperlinked like mad. Uh, it's a very simple file form. You can just read it, memory, it, dump, and it's done. Um, entities are the declarations, obviously. It's just what we call them in Odin. And yes, they can have different versions. So it can be invalid or a constant variable type name, procedure, procedure group, import name, or library name. Um, then we have all the different flags for the entities. And then all the different parameters in here, like for instance, its position, its name, its type, which is just type index, it has, it has all the information here. And this whole point is for code generation, which will be great for the new website and for many different uh, documentation people in general. Um, it also means that you can use this format, read it, and make your own documentation layout system for Odin if necessary. It's great. It's it's just built in like mad. Um, we've got some more improvement in core math for the new float 16 type, which is very nice. Um, we've got some general improvements to the image, uh, the PNG package as well, which uh, your own's done, or Kalimian is now seen in the chat. <clears throat> um, I've also had test fail now, which is nice for testing purposes. And I've also added the SOA zip and SOA unzip new um, uh, built in procedure to the demo. So if we, that's a wrong demo, let's reset the demo, because that might actually be helpful. I was just playing around earlier, which is never. Don't forget to fix things, Bill, before you go on to stream. <laughs> yeah, the, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Don't, don't don't forget that, guys. Because there we go. Thank you. I re reset. We go back to the demo, and here it is. The SOA. It was SOA zip. <clears throat> here we go. We got examples for SOA zip. All it shows is that you have the different slices for people who don't know what SOA zip is already. Um, you have say you got some slices. And you want to treat them as if they are actually made like a struct. Well, you just pass them into SOA zip. You name them, say, hey, this is the A, B, and C parameters, whatever. Or you keep them unnamed if you don't want to. It's going to be complete, complete anonymous. It'll just generate some values like underscore zero, underscore one, underscore two, like that. Um, <clears throat> and then you can iterate over the SOA slice as if it was just, because it was just it's an SOA array, effectively. Um, you can access the value. By the way, this is the same as just doing the index of that value. Or you can get the values individually, and this will do internally properly. This does not create a temporary value, by the way. It has its own addressing mode, which means that when you're addressing v.a from this, it does it the correct transformation internally, so it does it actually as doing as SOA correctly for you. So it's absolutely wonderful. This is like zip in um, Python, but uh, actually better, and maps better to the hardware, because it's properly SOA in that case. And also you have, um, you can recover the slices back from the SOA by doing SOA on zip and it takes them back and you print them. So just to prove that that is doing what it says it's doing, let's just go to the SOA struct layout, uh, faults, 
just run that particular one and I'm building the compiler as our oh, idiot bill. Um, I'll be right back after these stupid things from me compiling the entire compiler every time, which I don't need to do. Uh, run demo. Yeah, I know you don't know what that is because I've just changed it. So, go away. Go away. I don't want all that crap. There we go. So, the SOA slice thing here... And so in zip, we have all the different things, and this has got index zero, tells you, and then treats the column bits as the one, two, three. So we can actually see that. If we go, that's I love the SOA thing as well. We actually, it's a brilliant feature in that regard. Um, yeah, it should be really unuseful for vertex and yeah, RGB data on because you can treat it as if it was a single entity, but you've actually got them all in different slices. So that's why SOA is like before I was going to remove it because I couldn't really get it to work very well. But then I had a realization one day I was like, oh, why don't we just do, treat it like Python with zip? And then, whoa, whoa, that is a wonderful thing entirely. I will agree. Okay, so that's kind of all lovely, and there's some numerous different bug fixes, and yes, numerous different bug fixes. So that's always very good to know. If you have any questions about these releases, you can always go onto the discussions board and go onto the thing here, which you made discussions, I just made for it, and you can see and talk about it and discuss it to your heart's content. So I'm going to, oops, I'm already opening it, so I'm just going to up it, why not? There we go. If anyone's got any questions about the new release, please ask away. Yes, uh, there will always be new the new light builds, which of course have many of the bug fixes improvements in them. But if you want to wait till um, the next release, you'll have to wait till next month, which will be July, ju probably July the 1st. So good question. So, oh, this was the second thing I wanted to talk about is for people who know the release of Odin, the new compiler, I have a new thing which I made specifically for Odin, and that is paste.odinlang.org, which is, yes, correct, the new thing. This is actually a paste bin for Odin, specifically for Odin code. So you can now paste your wonderful Odin code and share it around to people. And this is very useful. Look, look okay, we have stuff in here. We also have, if I go slash demo, you can see the entire demo. Like, oh, look, it's the same demo. Oh, look at that. Isn't that magical? We can also just create our own. Um, and just post it where, wherever you need to be. Um, we also have all of the about pages on there if I need to, because I'm just storing them as text, so you can just store it as Odin code. Look, it's magic, isn't it? Um, and so on and so forth. Someone had a question about this pastebin saying, hey, um, you have a done question about pastebin, like how, how, do you, how does it store all the stuff without getting crazy expensive? This is great, so this is why it took a little, I didn't release it for a few weeks. Um, I wrote this... Uh, I've wrote this, taken into account how people are going to be using it. So I've limited each file. There's a maximum file size. It's quite small, by the way. I think I've maximum is about a megabyte, I'm saying, per file. Maybe a bit less, actually. I can't remember the exact number. I may have actually made it less. Maybe like half a meg. Um, so you know, there's a limit on how much you can upload. The other thing is it's all completely cached by Cloudflare. So many things will look, I don't have to use it on my bandwidth is what one something even though storage is eventually I'm also paying for the server for the storage as well which is fine but that's how you can keep it down is that it will do a lot of caching on um, Cloudflare and also the service provider I'm using for my servers and also other places where I'm hosting it because I'm host I'm not hosting the actual files on the server I'm hosting on elsewhere which they can then get clash get cached as well so there's multiple different places where like okay it's like well, this is a bit why is this is going to be slow it's like yeah but I am trying to worrying about how people it's all caching like the whole point is reduce as much bandwidth as possible so yeah that's kind of thing that's how we get keep it crazy expensive keep it down if it does turn out to be crazy expensive uh, just keep paying me more on Patreon. That's what you need to do. Patreon will help pay, pay for this. So there we go. <laughs> that, that is true. That's, and also, plugging the Patreon. There you go. So, uh, yes, of course, there is a thing, which uh, this is not view the public page. And yes, here's the Patreon for me, for the Ginger Bill. And yes, just please, you can play it pledge if you want and such. And it does help out the Odin developments. Does actually pay for stuff like this. To be honest with you, it pays for the servers on this. Um, uh, 
What you say? Maybe it could also be stored in reality on pastebin. Oh, good question. You could store anything on this because look at the lovely formatting it does on here as well. It's all properly formatted code, and I can just eh, look. Look at this. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I know you're all saying that. Also, by the way, the text editor here is just a basic HTML text box. But the, if people actually want to know the in, how I actually implemented this, was actually pretty clever. Is that um, you have a text box at the background, and then you have this, um, which is in, which is on front, but it's completely invisible. But on the background, you actually render the other text, and you render the text so that um, it is actually the the color, colorize thing because you, so it duplicates it. So the JavaScript just copies whatever's in the text box, this invisible, into the back thing and stylizes that. So that means you have this um, double thing. It's the only way I could get it. It's complete hack, but that's HTML for you. Yay. Um, so that was quite fun to figure out. And it's still not that perfect. So the question is, um, I don't use a database for this. That's the trick. There's many things you can. Oh, there's many ways of. I've got stuff to help um, um, abusing as well. Um, don't worry, I've got like like minim minimizing, um, uploading, and all that lot. Yeah, I, it's a very simple server, but it's a very simple program at the end of the day. <laughs> like it's got two API points. That's all you need. You need a post and a get. Oof. Oof. Yeah, there's no need to make it any more complicated. Yeah, you don't have to use pastebin. You can now use, because if it's pa it's blocked in some countries, that's correct. But odin, paste.odinlang.org, off, it isn't. It's even, it, it's better. Much better. So, that was the second thing on the plate tonight. We're talking about this. The third thing tonight, I'm actually not going to do some odin programming, I don't think. Um, mainly because it's really hot. It's been warm and very humid today. Um, it's been like 80 odd, 80 odd degrees, like what, 20, what, 28 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's been very, very high humidity, wanting to rain. Uh oh. Um, am I still streaming? Uh oh. Okay, am I back? Am I still on live? Sorry. For some reason, um, it said I had an, an error on Twitch. So did I ever drop out for anyone? I apologize. Uh, sorry, question. Does this understand nested comments? Well, there's only one way to find out. The answer is no. <laughs> it's because I just used the most dumbest syntax highlighting ever for this. And it's going to always be heavily improved, by the way. Um, you can see the JavaScript is live, so you can always tell me how to improve the JavaScript, at least for that. Uh, but please, please do. It's just regex at the most. <laughs> it's crap. But yeah, it's so yeah, it's a very good little thing, and it should help people to share their own code. And it's very simple to use. You just click share, and then you get the thing, and you copy and paste it. Look, you can click share. I think get a code for this one. And then I can copy it to my clipboard and then paste it wherever I need to. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it's consistent. I'm not saying who I'm applying to. Um, <laughs> yes, magic. Does it support the anchor line highlights? Well, look at this. It said it's highlighted on line 9, but you can actually also do this. You can go, oh, let's highlight line 10. Oh, no, I want to highlight lines 10 through 14. Oops, sorry, 10 through 14. Isn't, oh, look at that. So you just do it on this, and you just do the hash L and then 10 hyphen L14 for that. Um, you could then also do hash... I'd, uh, well, comma, I can do a comma in that, and I think, I think whatever, whatever I actually said it up to be, yeah. Well, there you go. So you can do all the highlighting, you copy that across, and show people what you need to do. So there's all this wonderful stuff that's in Odin Paste bin for you. Absolutely wonderful. It does everything, yeah. So you can always highlight stuff for you if necessary. It just does it in the thing. Any other questions about Odin Paste bin? It's very intuitive to use, I hope. Um, let's create a new paste if we want. 
and do whatever we need to do in here. Any more questions, or shall we head on to the secret? And the secret is not really that secret, but it is secret, but it's not. Right. So someone said, how is this going to be abused? The short answer is, well, every, anything could be abused. But the uh, second thing is, I've made precautions to make this less abusable on purpose. Um, there's loads of caching, putting many things in things front of a different little server, caching servers in general, uh, limiting requests, limiting the size of things that you can post on there in general, yeah. Um, <clears throat> no one will be able to figure out how to mine co coins on this because everything is complete, de like it's com everything is like complete separate from every other thing. Uh, let's try to be as mostly compartmental as pos possible. Um, I won't give you as much too details, not because I, it won't tell you anything, it's just like, it doesn't need it. <laughs> it's a really simple thing with a get and a post, and it does some other caching, loads of caching, and loads of um, limit, limit, limitations. So there you go. There will, the, as you went saying, there's no capture in front of it. Well, that is provided by Cloudflare. So Cloudflare does a lot of stuff like that as well, and it does the proper. It does again caching prevention and and de um, deni uh, denial of service attacks and such like for me for what I'm actually doing it for. So yeah, I've thought about most things in general, so don't worry about that. Okay, so shall we get to the second thing, which is effectively we may have to change the category of this talk, by the way. But I, I know I won't. I'll keep it the same because I want to. It's perfectly. I'm just going to be just talking. This is going to be kind of a live little podcast episode, is what I'm going to say. That was kind of the little surprise. So to do that, we can go quickly back to the transition over to oh the Odin logo with a lovely background, and um, yeah. So or we could even if if we really wanted to, I could go back to the Ginger Bill one. Which has now got the wrong colour text. But it doesn't matter. I, I think I know what I was doing wrong the other day. It's my fault. But hey ho. We can go back to let's go back to the only one, yeah. Only one's fine. So there's all the lovely things that happened this week. We've got so yesterday we've got the new release and also the pace bin was released yesterday. That was absolutely lovely. So for people who don't know, I could also just quickly go back to the new release. Um Oops, Daisy. It doesn't know. Oh, flipping heck. It's dumb. Dumb as anything. There we go. So we got the new release for people want to check out the Dev 2021.06 release, and the news got. We talked about the new language features earlier, the compiler improvements, and many improvements to the packages in general, and new impro new packages in general. So look, there's all this wonderful stuff. Please check it out, and if you want to be interested, you can read it here. And we also talk along with the discussion that goes along with this, which is uh, there's a discussion link somewhere. Where's the discussion link? I can't really remember. There's a, there's a discussion link somewhere on there. But yeah, it's just here. Here's a discussion link. You can talk about it if you want to discuss it more on the uh, discussion boards. Or you can go onto the Discord for the server and just have a good chat there as well. So, wonderful. Shall we get to the next thing? And I may actually want some like whiteboards. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Uh, one thing I actually wanted to discuss about was actually um, the aspects of design, designing Odin itself. Um... And how? What? And the short answer is why designing a language is actually difficult, or why designing a good one, which people want to use, is difficult. Is a better way of putting it. Um, designing any old language is not that difficult, but designing something good that people want to use that is very difficult. Um, and I wanted to, if, and also this is why I wanted to do live on Twitch because I wanted to ask kind of questions about this and such. Um, but it was also kind of get feedback on what people have with regards to certain aspects of the design of Odin. Because some people I know will say, well, this doesn't make any sense. And then when sometimes I explain to them, like, oh, that makes perfect sense why you did that. It's like, yeah, but it's not obvious why that's the case. And sometimes I do need to write this down. I'm an awful writer. I, it's usually why I don't like doing it anyway. Um, it's, it's not why I do it, because I don't like doing it. And also I don't think I'm I don't particularly like it. I know you could practice, but I've got so many other things to keep up with. <laughs> hey, you can't be a master of everything. Um... But the, the the interesting things is, hopefully everything is still up and running, because for me Twitch seems to be dying. Yep, that no, we still. Um, is 
is understanding why different aspects to it. So if we go, to, we, actually we could just go through the demo. I've, I've criticized things before on this before, but it's very interesting to understand where certain aspects of design come from and understanding what is the general philosophy of different ideas are. Um, so we could probably change this talk to, um, yeah, not in development, but I've ever signed, yeah. So hopefully, if, is that people that makes understand, makes sense what I'm talking about here with the design stuff? I'm going to, actually, you know what? Let's screw it. Let's get out the whiteboard and just write things on there as we go along. That should be interesting, right? Hopefully. I hope it is. And yes, a nice drink is. It is Schweppes Slimline Zero Sugar Zero Calories Lemonade made with lemon juice somehow. Somehow, uh, two percent. Ah, that's because that explains the five calories and the 0 0.08 grams of salt per 250 milliliters. Because, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Like, let's just get Milton open. Um, okay, so there's Milton, and we're gonna just show transition the screen. And hey, Presto, we've got the thing. So, this is um. Um, Seven Up isn't that bad actually. Um, I don't, as long as it's sugar-free Seven Up, actually, I don't like the I don't like sugary pop in general. It gets you know it feels the weird teeth. Um, yes, I'm trying to get that beach body with the slimline stuff. That is very true. Yes, yes. No extra sugar. I actually prefer the sugar-free stuff. I know that's extremely weird. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like um, uh, fine, whatever thing like this. So um, let's call this the. Uh, let's call this principles of design for Odin. Sure. So, kind of the different things I wanted to discuss today was different principles. Um, so, one thing that's been on my mind recently about this kind of ideas is conventionality versus unconventionality and how um how different language designers approach those aspects because in odin there are aspects which are unconventional to other languages but in many aspects of odin it's extremely conventional but this idea of conventionality has different two aspects to it of course so it's this question of what are these two different aspects of conventionality um so we have to figure out what those are. So we can say conventional has two con convention all has two different aspects to it. The first one is being being similar to other pre-existing conventions. So similar to pre-existing pre-existing um conventions and then the other aspect is defining conventions themselves rather than being not having them let the user defining so defining uh, conventions so the first one's pretty easy to understand most people understand this um, when you're saying you're similar to other pre-existing conventions, you're trying to not be too far from how other people use different things in general, like other languages. So many people in languages like we say, we'll say yeah, take Odin and compare it to C. Uh, Odin and C have very similar kind of aspects to them. For instance, yes, there's integer types, there's float types, there's Boolean types, there's string types, there's all these different things. And you're trying to be very similar of being how to other people are used to things. So that's being conventional. That's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. That's just a thing. But that does help with adoption of the people getting used to things because if it isn't different to what they're used to, then it's easier for them to understand the logic. Even if it's slightly different, if it's similar enough to what they're used to, then it's effectively good. It's actually going to be conventional. The second aspect is the more difficult part, which is defining conventions. And what this means is I would view this as either having there are predefined concepts in the language which you can use them to generate the things or 
and then what, what does that mean those predefined concepts are so the differences are between like the lift style of programming i would say on more of the batteries included style programming so the lisp style of programming has some basic building blocks that you build everything from and then you can generate every other constructs from it and that's the whole point is these have base and everything else in the language is generated from these basic building blocks but they are the base they are like the foundations now in that sense that is unconventional what that means is you haven't defined any conventions you've got the foundations and then you as the programmer has to define the conventions as you're going along and Similar to Lisp, and especially common Lisp, by the way, this extremely suffers, and the, one of the downsides of this approach is it suffers from dialects. It is so easy to have dialects because everything is, you can just build up general, more general things everywhere because it's no, there's no conventions yet to find because you're defining these new dialects to be conventional effectively. You have this segmentation, and not just that, you have the problem of... Um, each programmer effectively has their own unique dialect, which means if you're using like Common Lisp, your code will not work with anyone else's because you define your own di like conventions, which will not work. So this is the problem of conven uh, con conventionalities. You have this. I'm going to call this horizontal scale. Horizontal. Actually, you know what? Let's go to a different color this time. So we're going to call this Hori horizontal scale versus vertical scale. So most people understand what vertical scale is. If I explain it to you, think so vertical scale is when you're dealing with a code base or general is, is as it scales in size in general and get bigger and bigger or more and more complex usually, it can scale. Now most languages interestingly can deal with vertical scale you can write a lisp program and it will scale and scale and get bigger you write in fourth it will get bigger if you write in c as you can deal with this now vertical scale usually means a single uh, person so if you have a single person working on a project they can that individual can use pretty much any language they want as long as he's very productive in it and it's it's useful for that task at hand, of course. And when you do that with vertical scale, it's fine. The problem is horizontal scale. So vertical scale is pretty much code base um, <clears throat> size, um, but um, whilst horizontal scale is more to do with, um, I'm going to call it team size, um, or complexity or it's all code base complexity and and the code base complexity Let's, I can't you know what Let's scroll across and go code slow write down complexity is this making sense so far I hope so um, this is not like a podcast episode or anything like that but it's kind of live one so the problem is that most people understand this the the vertical version and they understand how they can do this but the problem is how do you design languages that can tackle the horizontal scale and the problem is is that different people on your team are going to have different knowledge they're going to have un different understandings they're going to have different many of these different things um, <clears throat> and it's going to be interesting And because of this, you have to worry about how this deals with. Any language, again, usually deals pretty well with code base size on the vertical scale, but the horizontal scale is dealing with different people. Now, how do you deal with horizontal scale? <clears throat> it is being conventional. That is the point. It doesn't mean, I don't just mean in one sense or the other. I mean in both senses at the same time. Different people have different uh, ways of doing things. So when you're dealing with multiple people on your team, be it literally two people or 50 people, um, you do need to define conventions. You need to define them. And if you're doing a language, it's better to have it defined in the language where it's fixed, that no one else can really change it, than having it defined at the company level or the project level and hoping everyone follows it. So if you have places where it makes sense that you can define it at the language level, then do so. 
if there are also the conventions that people are used to or that's the way they kind of naturally intuitively program like that's the other way of defining it using a pre-existing convention there's no point changing it. Like a very simple one is like using infix operators rather than using prefix or postfix. Like many people will tell you the advantages of prefix or postfix operators, like Polish notation at least is what it's usually called. But in general, it's very foreign to most people because they're used to reading and writing in infix all the time. So there's like, and also personally, I think the benefits of like Polish notation is quite minor compared to the difficulty of training people to think a different way when really the benefits are literally very, very minor. I understand the benefits, but they're more due to other reasons. So it's all of this dealing with things. And if you realize this is kind of what, this is also related to a third principle. I'm going to change the color again. This is the principle of least surprise. So this is a quite an interesting principle and this is harder to describe sometimes. So you're going to look, when you're doing conventions and seeing what people are similar doing it, you don't want to go against someone um, when they've got this general instinct or intuition or heuristic, depending on whichever view you can take. It's like so many different ways. I'm not going there. <laughs> but it's very different how to do it. If someone is naturally following a certain path and they keep making the same mistake, it's like there's something wrong with language. It's like, Maybe there's a reason why that. It may be just be that they're trying to make the language another language. Like they're trying to treat, let's say, make, I'm not joking, trying to treat Haskell as if it was C. It's not going to work. No wonder you're going to have all those mistakes. But if it is you are treating the language as it is, but you think there's a natural extension where it doesn't go in that route, as you think, then you should try and strive for that principle of least surprise. It's sometimes not possible, but you'll have to worry about it. Um... And yeah, so again, that's a good thing Clemina uh, has point in the chat that he says Mod modest um, horizontal scale allows reusing code without having to bolt yet another abstraction layer on top because the users can understand what it does instead of it just its surface. And that yeah, that's a good point. This is another point is where code reuse is a complicated thing. So code reuse does happen in both the vertical scale and the hor horizontal scale, both of them in different ways. But the problem with with um, <clears throat> code reuse, as many people may know, is that it's not necessarily... Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the best way of putting it. A good thing, which sounds bizarre. If you're trying to always re reuse code to minimize code reuse, you actually get things that are complicated. Sometimes it's just easier to copy and paste because then the problem with code reuse is you've got dependency problems. And dependency problems are a problem when horizontal scale and vertical scale interact. There's the issue. It's when your code base gets very complex and grows in size. And when you're trying to minimize the size, but keep, you still got the complexity, then uh, you've got an issue going on. Because usually it's the other way around. You're trying to minimize the complexity, but you don't mind, you can usually, it usually increases the size. So you have this um, balancing act between the two where you have um, you have to worry about size and complexity. And effectively, you want a graph. Ooh, you want a graph that looks like this, and you're trying to fo follow this kind of curve. Where if you've got a large size, you want to lower the complexity. If you've got a small size, you can have high complexity. If you you do not want to be, you want to be in this range effectively. You do not want to be in this range. Uh, this is bad zone. And this is kind of obvious when you, if you kind of program stuff. Again, I'm not trying to do a quantifying thing for a quant quality thing in general, but um, I'm trying to do comparison. Technically, it's not true, but yes. And it does feel like an optimization problem. That is, and it is an optimization problem. It's all to do with dependencies and such. Like if I had a third bit on here, it's, um, uh, we could say this is dependency. And this dependency thing would still have the same um, thing in there. It isn't the same as the hot crazy scale, yes, and the Vicky Ven Mendoza diagonal or whatever it was. Like here's the I'm not in the oh God, I'm not to how you make your mother. That's so just random facts. Um, is it Vicky Mendoza? I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, something like that. So I'm, I'm just getting distracted now. <laughs> 
But you can see here, it is kind of like a, um, it is a, it is a concave graph that's going on. And um, what goes on is, is this is the this is the thing is you're, you're battling between the two. Now, if you're defining conventions, you've actually reduced the complexity by a lot. Like you're putting a ceiling or um on the. For not necessarily putting a ceiling on it is that you're just lowering the curve already. So the complexity is already lowered if you define conventions. So it will just be lower now. Doesn't mean you can't get any higher. By the way, that curve will still be. It's like one over x if you say it, think of it that way. One over x. If even if you lower it, it'll still hit a point where um, you can pretty much go to infinity if you do it a certain way scaling. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. But this is kind of the different design things. So. When we talk about Odin, one of the most things that most people bring up, which is the most unconventional thing in Odin, is the declaration syntax. And most people seem to... This is interesting. I find this interesting. I don't understand why, actually, but... Most people seem to judge a language, a language's syntax, based on its declaration syntax. And it's kind of weird. <laughs> like, um, not necessarily uh, what you'd think. So what do I mean by that? So I've written an article about this before, but Odin's, what's, let's say the typical thing. So if people come from C, they are used to effectively having what I call, let's call this type focus syntax. It's not technically true. Uh, something like Java would be type focused, but C isn't technically. So let's do something close. Like for instance, hey, this is a um, int star x, and then we're gonna do, let's just do equals, one, uh, not wait, what am I doing? Not in star, just do, let's just do int. Yeah, let's do int x um, equals one, two, three. Like so. Now, C's approach here, this is, um, you can technically do this in a one pass, but the problem is that you still need a symbol table when you're doing it. So it's nothing to do with about one pass syntax or anything like this. Um, so I'm oh, sorry, some of the comment. This is the C approach, or I would call this type focus. There is um, qualifier focused, where qualifier focused effectively looks like this, um, which is kind of very similar to Pascal or more modern one would be Go, or many other languages like Rust. And, uh, many of them, this is more the more, more popular one. Odin's approach is a little different. Odin's, I'm calling it name focused. I've written an article about this before, the aesthetics of declaration syntax, and it does this. So, it changes the syntax based on the declaration. So these are all the same. Now for variables, most people are absolutely fine with it. It's when it comes to constants or procedures specifically. So in C, you would have a void, say foo, and it takes an int, say i, and then you got the body. In the other type of syntax, you would go with say func or something or proc, which is proc just to be consistent. Uh, proc foo um, i int and then some braces. It's really hard in a like thick font. I'm not lowering it, whatever. It's just trying to easy on stream for people. Um, but in the Odin approach, what we're doing here is foo colon colon proc, not pork, proc um, i int colon uh, braces. Now, when people see this, they go, oh, what's the colon colon mean? What does this mean? And th the thing is, is that th this is actually simpler than some of the rest. And it's actually a bit more unified. And people, it, when you look at it, it doesn't seem like it, but it's like, once you understand what the colon means, I'll be like, oh, that makes perfect sense. But it's this initial weirdness, because it is unconventional in the first sense of that term, as I said. Again, the first sense is the similar to pre-existing conventions. There's not many languages that do this, really, especially for constants. Um, because the other approach you could I could have done was const uh, foo and then write proc um, i int. And some languages have done this, by the way. Um, I think one of them would be zig. But zig is actually 
interesting this is kind of a side note zig um, originally had more this for procedures and then constant uh, all constants have this but they're wanting to unify to this so effectively they've got the same semantics as odin it's kind of funny but it's like um i figured out all the problems with this as well and zig has figured out though had solutions to its approach now um but it's just kind of funny I'm like I, I knew what the problems were it's like already i solved them but for odin so it's funny how languages kind of come. To, sometimes they converge, sometimes they don't. But yeah, it's always about the um, different things. But semantics-wise, you can technically make all of these work the same. Not necessarily this one, but you can make them all pretty much work the same. Um, and it's quite, it is very interesting. And what, again, some people said there's many issues with the C declarations act. One you have to have a parse table. Another one is that C specifically, the same as C plus plus, is that the declaration matches its usage, which is it is queer as anything it does, it's like when people actually don't even know how it works unless you do that it doesn't make any sense um and yeah sorry you you bring up a very good point um barkow um and barkow or how you pronounce your name i apologize i don't really care uh, <laughs> sorry um is this you say yes the the kind of the complexity the size thing of that code bases which is the intersection of the horizontal and vertical scale problems is yeah it's very similar to compression and it's a very interesting way about thinking about things about programming in general is about kind of this form of semantic compressing of code is that again if you have a big size of and low complexity it's highly compressible but if you have something of low size but really high compressibility it's not going to be easily compressed and it is all about the entropy of the system you're right um but it is a good a good kind of abstraction to think about and it's also about things about language design in here and you have to think about what i'm doing so let's talk about some practical things about what conventions odin has taken because it's not obvious what conventions I've done, especially if you're coming from C. If you're coming from other languages, you don't realize they're conventions. Um, a good example in Odin is uh, slice types. This may sound like, wait, how is that a convention? It's like, because if you're used to C, in C, well, there's no actual real convention. In C, you've got uh, like a pointer and then you've got like a, maybe a size underscore T that you're passing around separately. And like these are separate things um and th that's kind of like okay and then depending on like oh no certain conventions i'll have the prime to, the length first and the pointer next or the point like okay so there's another issue is like okay you've got a pointer in c and then you don't even know if it's a pointer to a single value or if it's representing array of values or it's representing just a general memory address that's typed Again, there's different way, uh, different memory models. So it's like, okay, it doesn't know that. In C, it, uh, it, it just goes like, okay, we're defining what an, like an array reference is. We are separating that from a pointer in the language, which is just that. It's pointy. And they are kind of separate constructs. And like pointers in Odin do not allow for index notation, like unlike C, where um, in C, if I did x i that is identical to if i did the dereference of x plus i that's what it does that's all that does effectively technically some compiled to different optimizations based on this but that's the internal details semantically wise they are identical <clears throat> which shows the point arithmetic magic going on but odin doesn't do that it says no no pointers don't have point arithmetic that's another convention that's what c had a convention with point arithmetic because it traded off by not having an array type um so yes, a good way of thinking about a slice is thinking to call them as fat pointers. That is another way of thinking about them. Yes, they are fat pointers. They're a pointer that also encodes a length um, to them. Another convention that Odin took is string. <clears throat> Odin has a string type. And C's convention is... Um, so string is actually internally a, a byte slice. So internally... Um, internally... A slice of bytes... But why has Odin, this may be a good question, I'm going to actually ask the people to the audience if you want to answer, why does Odin define a string type and why doesn't it just have a slice of bytes? Why am I defining the convention of what a string is? It's actually a really interesting question when you think about it because it's not obvious because in C you think well, we just have char pointers so don't we have a string so that's effectively what a string is so why do we need a specific string type? I'm just going to have a drink whilst you, people will discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, okay. Is everyone ready? Ready for the answer? It's pretty simple. It's not just about encodings. It's not because runes are variable lengths. Yes, they're all different conventions that I've defined. Like, our conventions of a string is assumed to be a UTF-8. It's because a string has different semantic information to, than an array of bytes. A byte is effectively just a number or a, a blob of information. It hasn't got the same semantics as a string. It doesn't represent text, even though it could in store text. It doesn't mean it has the information, the semantic information that it is a text. Because you could say, hey, look, an integer at the end of the day is just like an array of bytes. So why don't we just use array of bytes? And the thing is, you can go that way. You can actually go that way. And thinking, and then you're defining everything in terms of the operations that work on it. But then you're back to assembly. Um, and, and that's one thing. So another thing, so that's kind of the thing, is that semantically it's a string. And um, you kind of see that strings are useful because we are dealing with a textual language at the end of the day. And whilst we deal with text all the time, we have string literals everywhere. So really, we do have this concept of a string type already in the language level, even though we could theoretically just have it be as an array of, like, a slice of bytes. There are all the very good people uh, things that people were talking about, like the implementation details. Like, for instance, yes, you could allow for string interning rather than just relying on everything being a separate value. Yes, you can also realize that a string is actually because it's got different encoding information that in indexing it or assigning to it is going to be it's going to have different semantics like for instance you cannot assign to a string index in odin because they're immutable because they've got different semantics it's because in practice i this is one actually my side detail but i found in practice in most c code bases people rarely ever um assign to a string index and when they do it's because effectively they want a string builder They've got a backing bytes buffer, which they can use to generate the string. Or if they just want to do a quick optimization, something in place. And it's like, okay, each of them isn't really a string. You're not, you've got a string build or something you're building a string with. The second one is you've got a backing buffer, which you're modifying, so you're building a string. And then the third one is like, well, you just do some optimization hack, which is effectively a backing buff buffer but this is it none of it is actually treating as a string it's just you're building a string in that case so there's a difference so in odin we actually have different we have a string builder in odin in fact the core library string builder we'll do let's go back to green this let's go green this time um strings dot builder exists and this allows you to build strings easily now many people prefer using the fumpt stuff so like fumpt uh let's say a print f so this allocates a string for us. And there's also the T printf as well, which is the temporary alloc it's used as the temporary allocator instead. But these are all like kind of effectively string builders. They are not strings in themselves, they generate a string. And and that's where a lot of languages I have found this is the issue. It's like, yes, many languages have a concept of a string type, and it's because it's semantically useful. Even if internally it's the same as a byte slice of bytes. Like internally, at least, like semantically, they to treat it differently. Another way of thinking about it is this: that when you do fumpt, uh, I'm gonna say this, but when you're dealing with this, it's fine. So the sec, I'm just trying to finish the original thought. Then, <laughs> so many languages do seem to try and unify the concept of a string, a string builder, and a bytes buffer. They're not the same. Like semantically, not the same. It's not how you treat them are the same either. Even though this is why a lot of people love like string concatenation because like, oh, I just need to build some strings together with some other strings. Like you want a string builder now effectively so yes it's nice and easy to do but there's the problem is is it's nice and easy to do it removes it hides the cost of what it is now in a lot of higher level languages which allow that they usually have like some garbage collection or something so they can afford to do it <coughs> or, or automatic reference counting or something general automatic memory management in general in odin when we have manual management you want to know when things are being allocated usually pretty much so you need to actually have control over that <coughs> So that's one way of thinking. So separating them is very useful. Okay, <clears throat> what's the second reason for strings? Well, not saying one of the other reasons. There's multiple reasons. It's not even the second one. I think I've probably discussed four already. <laughs> the other reason is for serialization. So when I go <clears throat> and do this, fumpt, um, dot print a line and do x, whatever x is, it prints it correctly for me. If it was just a byte array, then 
it would it would be like, uh, should this be printed out as numbers or should it be printed out as characters? It doesn't know. Or should it be like, oh, this is actually a multi-encoding thing? So if it was a binary, it doesn't know. Now, the argument that many people say is, no, what you meant to do is actually um, uh, give the formatting to it and then does it correctly. So many people will say, actually, the way like CMET languages would do it instead of this, what you should be doing is doing fumt.printf doing, I don't know, percent %s uh, backslash n. Like, really hard to write, <laughs> write code like that. And do that way in the formatting approach. So you tell the thing how to format it. But here's the thing. Automatic serialization, because it knows all the r runtime type information already, is a hell of a lot more useful. And again, it's semantically different. So this is one of the conventions again. This is again of the convention setting in Odin. And it's very interesting where you're defining these conventions. Which one of the big conventions, which many people seem to over, over, not misunderstand. Yeah, they misunderstand it, to be honest with you. And uh, and I've seen many people who misunderstand this. And I've seen people see me on the Discord having like a mini rant over this in general. But it's not necessarily, um, I, 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 it's, it's hard to explain. So let's go over, let's just go over here. <clears throat> I'm trying to talk and I need to have a drink. Because I've got the lemonade. Lovely lemonade. You're right, it's also meant to have information at the compiler. Yes, I didn't see that. So there's many technical de reasons to have strings over just bytes arrays, um, array of bytes, but it's also because it's semantically different and it helps with the serialization, runtime information, co compiler reading the code, the human reading the code. And so on and so forth. So this leads up to another convention, the convention of uh, packages. As a convention. Now, I use the word package, library, module, usually interchangeably, because I just use it to mean a group, of, it's, a, it's pretty much a collection of code, which then can be reused elsewhere as a single unit. That's effectively what a library is, or a package, or a module, whatever. It's not a collection of multiple of those libraries, which call, I used to call them a library collection, or a collection of packages, or whatever. So this is an interesting problem. So most people, most people who design languages in general, most people who use languages, understand the benefits of namespacing. So most languages, let's say ignoring C, for example, have some concept of a namespace which is separate from the body of like a procedure or a type itself. They can do other namespacing. Now some, depend, but the thing is, what do you do with the namespace and why is it useful? Well, first off, it reproduces namespace collisions is a good thing. So there's one aspect of a uh, package is here. You've got namespaces like so. Um, another one is the interface to it. Uh, another aspect to packages you've also got to worry about is is um, dependencies. In dependencies, sorry, I couldn't spell today. Um, other aspects between that is uh, it's reusability. Usability. Um, another one is this is for organization. By the way, these are all different separate points. Um, I'm trying to think of other information regarding packages. Right now, there's actually a few, there's one more I know. Um, another one is um, containment, which is slightly different to organization, but containment. So theoretically, a, ge a generic namespace, let's say like C++'s namespace, allows for organization, containment, re even reusability to a certain extent, but it doesn't tell you an interface, it doesn't tell you about dependencies. So okay, we could do what Python does. Okay, let's think of the Python approach then. Okay, so the file is a namespace, and in fact you can import a file. So okay, so the file thing gives us uh, namespaces, it gives us gives us effectively an interface, which is the interface, the namespace itself. Um, it does give you a dependency because it's dependency is now part of the file system. So you can have um, a hierarchy um, file system 
and many other things like this, um, stuff like that. It doesn't mean you can reuse things, you can multiple import, it does help with organization, and it just thinks containment. So it does actually solve a bunch of these problems. But here's the thing is, ask yourself, is that well defined? There's the problem. How do you well define a package? Because there's extra things related to all of this. Like for instance, one thing is uh, uh, versioning. You've got to worry about. And uh, these are the, I would call these the extra things which are required, but they're not necessarily well defined. Um, you've also got to worry about <clears throat> is structure. of your package uh, structure. And then another aspect is, again, it's the, the second, these are the secondary things or the tertiary things, I'm not sure which one of them, is regarding how you deal with these. Um, import graph, I'm not calling it a graph, um, which then leads onto cycles. But there's many different things on here as well. And um, <coughs> it, it does get very difficult about how you deal with these things. And I, there's many languages that really do not solve this problem. Because the problem is what happens with all of these things and the consequences of how you do the, the, do the design decisions. So most people completely understand namespaces. They understand why you want to have different namespaces because you don't want to have name collisions. So this is um, uh, collisions and uh, local locality to it all. Um, so there is this kind of issue of the locality because when you've got things they should have to worry about the namespace collision you only have to work in your code and then and no one else have to worry about it. with C you've got a global main space you're going to have to do things again C is just treats as one giant file that's effectively what the thing is so there's no real concept of a package C++ has no real concept of a package either yes it has namespaces it doesn't really have an interface. It doesn't really have any way of doing the dependencies. It doesn't really it doesn't know about dependencies. It doesn't it helps reorganization? It does organization, which is the, with the namespaces in general. It doesn't really do any containment because everything's global space, even if there's multiple namespaces. It has no idea about versioning, and it doesn't really enforce the structure. So it doesn't meet the requirements of what a package is. Well, let's try Python again. Let's look at a Python. Yes, it has namespaces. Does it have an interface? Well, everything is just in there. So yeah, everything's public. So technically, this is a uh, public um, versus private. And this is the module level, by the way, package level. Uh, dependencies, uh, yes, because due to the import graph, it has it. Um, yes, and also it allows for cycles. Reusability, well, yep, it allows for reusability because it does because you allow imports, fine. Yes, it allows for organization because it exploits the file system. So this is um, also related to that point. Containment, yes, it's now related to the, guess what, the file system. Versioning, yes, yes, it technically does have versioning, um, but that's usually extra metadata. And structure, yes, it's relying on the file system, the explicitly file hierarchy in that case. So, okay, Python does have well it does have packages. The thing it, it struggles on is probably the versioning, but that's done through external conventions. So there is no language level, uh, <clears throat> language level, versus tooling? And that's a good question. Even Odin doesn't have this yet. It's, I already know how to do it, by the way. Um, but dependencies also is technically implicit for how you deal with things. So it doesn't actually note technically. So technically, Python doesn't have a technically a well-defined package either. In the language level, it has it in the tooling level, like pip, but that's about it. Um, other things with packaging, you can also technically, there's the second, there's like tertiary, there's the R tertiary things, like for instance, ABI and stuff, but let's ignore them for the time being. Let's take Go. Let's take the more most recent versions of Go, to be honest with you. Does it have namespacing? Yes. Does it have an interface? Yes, with public and private. Does it have dependencies? Yes, it now with the Go mod stuff. Does it allow reusability? Yes. Organization? Yes. At the language level, by the way. Containment? Yes. Versioning? Yes. Structure? Yes. So Go actually has a full on definition of what I would class as a package. Let's check with Odin. Let's see what Odin makes up. Yes, namespaces. Yes, interface. Yes, dependencies at the language level. Technically, yes. Um, reusability. Yes. Organization. Yeah, very lot. A lot more. Containment. Yes. Uh, versioning. 
No, this is not there yet, but I know I would know how to do it. I've just not needed it yet because it's not actually become a big issue yet. Um, structure, yes. Um, Odin deals with collisions and locality. In fact, allows nesting fine. Um, deal, the way it deals with the hierarchy, is it going to be flat or um, deep? And Odin settles for the flat problem. It says it tries not to have any hierarchies anywhere else. There's effectively no like sub packages or anything like that. Everything is pretty flat. Yes, the file system is used for for um, organization and containment, and that is the a hierarchy that you already need. There is no le diff different levels. What about import graphs? Yes, um, Odin does not allow for cycles, so that's pretty good. Um, what about versioning? Yeah, and then the structure, yes. So Odin nearly, nearly fits perfectly the world fine pack package. So let's say versioning, it just misses on versioning effectively and partially on dependencies. Like not much on dependencies, like only one aspect because of the versioning. That's all it fails on. It's because of versioning. But that's because I haven't defined it language level yet. I know how to do it. We just need to have a little bit of extra metadata and problem solved. Um, like literally, it's bad like it. Okay, let's look at uh, let's think of another modern language. Um, Rust. Let's try Rust. Does it have namespaces? Yes. Does it have a names interface? Yes. Does it wonder about dependencies at the language level? I think. Uh, no, it does it by convention because of crate. Does it with an et metadata file? So technically no, but it's because crate is pretty much the only package manager. Then yeah, let's say halfway. Let's say it's give it half point. Um, reusability. Yes. Organization. Yes. Uh, containment. Yes, versioning, again, it's not part of the technical language, but it's a very big convention anyway. And it has technically with many of the attribute stuff, so well, I don't want to go wrong there. And structure, yeah. Um, so it nearly has got well-defined, but it's technically is mostly well-defined, so Rust is no problem. Uh, what's another modern language I'm trying to think of? Let's try Zig. Uh, Zig has namespaces, yes. I'll explain how they work in a minute. Interface, yes. Dependencies, uh, not the language level because it doesn't have no again no versioning. Does reusability technically yes? It does allow for cycles yes. Um, organization yes, but I'm going to explain. Technically, it relies in the file system. It's not part of the level. So technically, n n n yeah, kind of containment yeah. Uh, structure yeah. So s this is the case. This this is Zig's weird thing. So I've been talking about namespaces as if they're a separate construct. Zig unifies namespaces with types so types have namespaces um so they are the things that have namespaces that's the idea in zig and that means a file in zig is actually a struct i'm not joking a file is a struct in zig i think this is kind of insane because to me they are semantically cons different constructs even though something like c++ you can ha treat a struct as if, it, as if it was a namespace but clearly c++ added another construct which was a namespace like a separate construct, because there's clearly a difference between the namespace of a struct and the namespace that contains things. Like, it's not a type in itself. So there's this separation of ideas, even though you can unify it, and it makes sense with Zig, because this actually shows the, um, going back to the vertical and horizontal scale, this absolutely works fine with the vertical scale, in a sense, because it's kind of like a lispy approach. But it, I would say... And I don't, this is the problem with Zig, it's because it's unconventional in both senses, it's unconventional how it does namespaces, it's also unconventional because the concept of a package doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a package in itself, it's only structs and files, effectively. So in this case, Zig does not meet the requirement of package because it doesn't have any concept. It's just a struct. So therefore, it's going to have the issues of like versioning and worrying about. And this is where like many people in the Zig community are going to have issues with the package managers because if you the issue with package managers are trivial if the concept of a package is well-defined. You pretty much have to have all of these requirements and then you define it fine. There are the secondary tertiary problems which are not necessary to define a well-defined package, but they're more like how does it interact with other things, which is the really interesting problems, by the way, with all the girls packaging. But that's like, okay, I think Zig is going to fail in there. Odin will fail at the moment with regards to fate versioning, and I'm very honest about that. But adding that little bit of metadata, which is defined at the language level, would solve all that problem. And I think that's a nice little way of thinking it. But this is the problem with Zig, is like, he doesn't, and I, I'm, this is not criticism, this is being critical of Zig. I'm not saying it's bad. It, it is more of a, like, hey, do you, which kind of approach do you like? And everyone's different, obviously. Like, everyone is different. Um, and if you like Zig, Odyssey, that's brilliant. I mean, I mean it. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, go use what you love. 
um, is the best tool for your jobs. But it's just for me, I'm like, I always rub, it kind of rub me a wrong, the wrong way. And it's very hard to read because to me, I think the concept of a namespace and I'd say a package like namespace and a, and a type like namespace are completely separate, like semantically. And that's because most people are used to that convention. It always goes back to this conventionality thing. And it's like, do not try and be... <sighs> Define conventions, don't go against uh, least surprise and aim for what people are used to. And it's it's kind of like, look, I, I don't, I understand why, like, Zig, and it's, again, it's not a criticism of Zig. Um, it is being critical, it's not necessarily saying it's bad. It's more saying this is unconventional. Every other language seems to have actually had this separation of what a package-like namespace is and a type-like namespace is. So I think the unification is probably a bad idea in practice because I think it will be a problem when it has to worry about horizontal scale when you're worrying about team sizes and worrying about complexity of the code base and worrying about literally external third-party code where you need to work you're relying on these conventions like oh are you going to define a type as if it was like is it just in a thing and then you import the type from that file or you're going to treat the entire file as a thing and you now you've got these two different dialects popping up in fact you've technically got more than two dialects popping up because it's how the file system interacts in the world a lot. So you've got this interesting. Now, the one argument many, some or not many, I would say some of the very, very few people, and this is an interesting thing about Zig, is because importing in Zig and importing a thing is actually not part of the language, which is really interesting. So Zig, in that case, is actually a lot more closer to how C works. So just a very quick thing, in, in Zig you do import, and it's this is the built-in things. It's not actually a language semantic, and then you put the path to the thing in there. And then it'll import this as an entity, like a, a type. So then when you're using it, you can do, say, const, let's say, x, foo, and there's the path. And that's your importing. So that is literally all it is. And realizing that's the case, that means really zig the language, technically, would be very distinguished between zig the language and zig the compiler, doesn't have a concept of even a file. It's like C in that regard. It is very... It's very interesting. It's like very peculiar. I don't know if anyone else has tried out Zig before and stuff like stuff like that. It's like it's like pretty much the idea is that a lot of the built-in things, anything with the ampersand, the at on it, the at symbol, it could theoretically be removed from the language theoretically, and then you could still use the language on its own. You don't really want to because there's some very useful things in there, like again import, um, but that's kind of not what the language is, and they are more like extensions, compiler extensions for the language. And that's a very good question, is what do you have as your found foundation? And what do you have as your conventions? And then what do you have as an extent extensions to language? Because Odin has intrinsics. It has intrinsics which are technically compiler extensions, which the idea is that all of the intrinsics in the language theoretically could be removed. They are vendor-specific, um, theoretically. Um, I'm not saying they are necessary, but they are. most of them would be vendor-specific whilst um, um, the built-ins in Odin are not vendor-specific, they are language-defined. So there's a very minor distinction there. It's just like what's over built-in. Like 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 Len, that's uh, built into Odin. That's not vendor-specific. But something like Intrinsics, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like one, the ones I knew, just knew we talked about, like Mem0. Hey, that's vendor defined, like the, the defender is very useful for implementing stuff. And um, it, it's a nice, interesting thing. Like, hey, where do you define things? How, what is the language thing? And it's always making this distinction between the language and the library. I hope people, this is interesting to people, please say if it isn't. <laughs> um, it's always quite interesting about how you design things and how different language designers approach this problem. Because it's clearly different tastes, it's clearly different domains and problems. Because if you try different styles, like for instance, if you go the more lispy approach, like Zig's kind of very lispy in that regard, um, you can actually have different things emerging from it. Where, like Odin, which is very batteries included, it's very Go like or very Python like in that regard, it has many different things that are already well defined in the language. These are the general conventions that you should be using for most of your tasks. And if you need anything specific, you can go lower if necessary. Like Odin has the tools, but it will not be as idiomatic as the default, which is the difference, is, is the idiomaticness, which I'm going to get rid of this again, just because it was a temporary thing, which is idiomatic um, constructs. 
Now, the question is, again, it's where do you find these idioms? Are idioms defined at the language level or are they defined at the tooling level or defined at the cultural level? And it's very difficult because you've got all these different layers to worry about. You've got the issues of the language. You've got the core library. If there is one for in, in the hypothetical language. Um, you've also got the tooling um, slash ecosystem. And then the last thing is the general culture. And, and this is one of the issues is you will have to be opinionated when you define something. You have to define kind of when you're thinking about, okay, this idiomatic convention, this construct, this convention effectively, who you're letting it decide it. Now, if you're letting it in the language level, like here, this is effectively being very opinionated, but it's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. You, someone's got to have an opinion somewhere. Um, where are you going to find it? Now, you could always define it at the core library. It's just a convention people use. Um, but if it's people don't use the core library, then they don't really use that convention. So it's a similar more thing. If it's in the tooling system, it's a little bit harder to enforce. Um, like, for instance, we say, are you going to use spaces or tabs? Oh, God, I hate that. Well, I don't, to be honest with you, I need to be consistent. But to enforce that conv idiom, idiom, you'll probably need that in the tooling system. Like, for instance, the up-and-coming thing, which will be soon, which is the Odin Fumpt, um, which is the, the, the code formatter. So that's one way of dealing with that. You could de define it at the language level. You will annoy a lot of people, by the way, with that particular case. Um, and then the other one is culture. So is that these are just general idioms that people have during the culture. And they're very hard to enforce, of course, because once you go further and further down, it becomes harder and harder to enforce. And so you have... So this is the scaling is going to become opinionated. Um... Opin opinion opinionated level and then this is going to be the direction of um, opinionated and then also the going down this is enforcement uh, difficulty And that's the issue. If you can see what you can do with these different ways of thinking about things, is if you put it more in the language level, you're going to be it's more opinionated, but it's a hell of a lot easier to enforce. If you're leaving up the call chart, you're not being opinionated, but believe in hell, you're not going to enforce anything. Like there's not going to be a single thing. So this is where the issue is, um, and it's quite interesting. That's the case. Um, so again, hopefully this makes make, making sense to people, making it clear, understanding what's going on. Um, because it's not necessarily easy. <clears throat> but yeah, so again, this is another thing I kind of bring up as well. And uh, this is just a minor tangent. Hopefully, again, I'm going on loads of tangents tonight. Probably it's just due to the heat. <laughs> Damn heat and humidity. Um, but... Uh, I bet most people have noticed this, but maybe not always notice it in the... I've said it in this words. Oh, sorry. Think. Changing culture after it's bootstrapped is nigh impossible. Yeah, I completely agree. So you don't want to leave standards up to something that's both ephemeral and stubborn. Like, yeah, very agree. Yeah, completely. There are some aspects where the culture has already defined idioms already, which is the whole point of, like, being like, okay, there are already conventions that people used to, so don't fight them. So you could fight, actually say, whatever idioms are were in the culture, and if you were designing a language, you can put them into the language itself. So there's the thing is that, yes, the thing is defined in the culture, and they were very popular, popular already, and but then you can force them into language, and then you just in, you've codified, effectively, an idiom by putting it into the language. You can always put some idioms at the library level here, but it's not necessarily... Um, uh, great in that sense but yeah again also the tooling is different so it might but this is the thing is where some people take this a bit further they try and enforce everything at the language level and it's a very difficult balance like for instance rust is extremely opinionated and what i mean by extreme opinionated is it's because of its ownership semantics and lifetime semantics because it's being really opinionated in that particular little area um, if you try and go anywhere outside of it, it, you'll just have a hissy fit here and just like, oh, like, well, I wanted to program. Well, no, we, we've got opinionated how you should, ought to be programming for better or for worse. 
And many languages will have this very opinionated thing. So the problem is, is that you don't want to be... This is the problem is that, yes, you're being opinionated, which can be good or bad, by the way. Um, but it, it does um, it does mean enforcement not as difficult. So if you think your opinion is a good idea to enforce, then maybe, yeah, it's probably a better idea. But it's like, it don't, not necessarily it's the truth. And this is the problem with the design, as you can see here, that you've got many different compromises and trade-offs to worry about and it's like all aspect of design and it's very hopefully that makes sense i'm covering loads of different things very carefully i could honestly talk about every single aspect like this i could talk for about 10 hours on i'm not joking because i could tell you all the issues and the hierarchical things and all the things that emerge from it like i've not even talked about the secondary or tertiary aspects of it like, i've tried not to it's something i would like to get down but good god you, I, you could literally write a book on this um and all the problems that people have in practice Jen, it's always about this idiomatic and trunks. And again, I'm keeping the topic topical, <laughs> keeping it on topic with regard to conventionality and principles of design. Um, I'm trying to keep that there. Okay, so another one. Yeah, it's a lot easier to sell people on a version 1.0 of a library than it is to, than a 1.1 of a language. You're right. Um, and a library change is one or two lines of any program. And a, a program, a core language change needs a lot more. Yeah, a lot more to it. You're right. Um, to be more judicious, judicious, uh, judicious. Oh, that's a hard word to say, <laughs> for me at least. Um, but yeah, that, that's the issue, and you're right, like, it's because this is effectively the foundation, and if you've got the foundations good enough, then people can build stuff on top of it. It's the same thing, it's this bottom-up idea of thinking, but you've got to worry about it from... Um, it is horrible to like design. Like, for instance, if you're worrying about what the culture is, like, there's certain things in your language which you can nudge. So you have to worry about nudging as well. So it's, it is, again, a horrible thing to design because you have to worry about what people normally do as well. Like, I could enforce people. Like, I was discussing with someone the other day, um, and he was kind of saying, like, Bill, why did you why do you have the context system? Like, isn't it better to just explicitly pass allocators around everywhere? And like, well, not even just that. Why didn't you make the allocator system which is just effectively arena? Because most of the time, actually, arenas are what you want, and that's all you need. And I'm like, I said, I agree with you. That's correct. But that's not how everyone programs. And not just that. The problem, like I was explaining, the context system in Odin is effectively there to solve the problem of intercepting third-party code. Because you may not have control of how third-party code works or how it does or how it defaults to things. So you may need to intercept things. Like a very good place of interception is in allocating memory. You may actually, you may just want to change how it allocates memory by changing the allocator. And if it defaults to the basic context allocator, then that's really trivial to do. It, the, someone can always be explicit and use explicit allocators everywhere in there. And in that case, you can't really do much about it. But if they're using the general convention, by the way, like the context system, then they shouldn't, the, the writers of that Lang uh, like library should not have any issues um and it's <laughs> it's kind of interesting that's the case but then the second thing i said to him is like look you may not just want to change things you may just want to track the allocations you may just want to put, to put a tracker allocator on which many people love again and the tracker allocator is more of a um way of just tracking how much the allocator thing is, when is it allocating, where is it allocating, doing this. You're not changing the actual like, allocation strategy anymore doing that. But the thing is, like, as again, I was speaking to this individual, he just kind of saying, um, wh why don't you just say it, try and try to treat everyone to do like arena? I'm like, look, most people don't even know about um, custom allocators, but the people who do are usually very technical and very pretty much experts effectively in that field. Um, I'm not saying I'm an expert, but like effectively you're beyond most people if you know how custom allocators work and just general concept of the idea um, beyond malloc and stack allocation, of course. Um, but then you're like, okay, so once people know that, but then actually knowing how, what the actual good strategies are and what in general, yeah, you mostly just need a heap allocator and maybe a ring buffer and then everything's just built from a heap allocator, obviously. But try and enforce that at a language level means you're being too opinionated because you're assuming something about how people want to design their language and especially if you're dealing with third-party code that code may not be assuming that and it's like oh they've designed it in a more traditional approach with malloc and free everywhere effectively um which is not like all that odin obviously but yeah. um but if you can see the kind of idea so sometimes and you have to worry about these ideas and it's a bit more like it's a horrible thing from design some because you have to worry about again what is the general culture already how do you deal with the general culture at the language level 
Which conventions do you value? Which idiomatic constructs? An own solution for this third-party inception was the context system. And I think it's the best uh, compromise that I've come up with for it, with the specific semantics I've added and the specific ideas in there. Like, for instance, with the context system, you can actually make procedures act as if they were closures. Like, for instance, many libraries in C, you'll have, like, a callback, and usually you'll have a parameter in there and then a user data, which is usually a void pointer, and you can usually intercept it. But not all libraries do that for their callbacks. So the thing is, like, how do I pass a user data pointer to this callback? Well, here's the clever trick. You just pass it in the context system. You literally have the context, and then you pass your user pointer in there, and then when you get to your callback, you just read the user pointer and it works. That's a brilliant way of literally re getting around what someone's library system hasn't done well. It's an interception code, of course. Again, this is not necessarily foolproof. You have to know what you're doing, of course, and what you're doing. But if the library doesn't allow for it, then in other languages, you would have to make global variables or global data or do loads of other lovely hacks. This approach is like, okay, it is a hack. We know it's a hack, but it gets around this. And it's a way of getting around this, but using a well-defined construct, being idiomatic. And that's kind of the lovely things about all this um, is because you've got to worry about all the different aspects. Like context is clearly solving one problem, which is third party and concepts. You can use it for other things, but that's all it's there for. That's the whole point. There are other, there are other approaches, but I think that's the best approach, even if it has flaws to it. Um, so, okay, that's good. So yeah, sorry, yeah, you, yeah, you, um, and you're right. So it's, it's great to be a Bob Ross some, something when you're prototyping that. Yeah. When you're actually asking people, because you can ask people, including my future self, um, to actually talk about things. And also you can also rely on people using things and, um, it, it can't just be right. You can't be a Rembrandt. You can't just be like, Oh, in isolation, just do it. And the beautiful thing after chat, I think you kind of have to figure this out. It's like, you have to have this dialect dialectic with other people you have to have a talk you have to dialogues with people to find um what actually works and you you talk with people and you find these different idiomatics like the the general kind of flavor of odin i think 80 percent of the language i'm not joking the flavor of it was probably done in two months two or three months when i made the language that's how long it took me it's that last 20 percent which has taken me four four nearly five years four and a half years like that's how long it is and yeah and it's it's been a very difficult thing um not necessarily easy now again again kalim is making a good point like i kind of have looked out by inheriting the handmade network culture because the initial code base is full of people doing more than yeah you're right more than pay pay, uh, pay lip service um to performance and opening black boxes because they are trying to do things and they will be using things they know what they're they've got more expertise and such they are actually trying to deal with real problems they're not just saying what they think are real problems they're actually doing them and saying hey i've got this problem how do you deal with this but that's it's kind of a good thing but the problem is you're right it's also a bad thing in the aspect that you've kind of got not necessarily a monoculture but you've got it is not representative of the average program anymore. And speaking to the average programmer is going to be very difficult. Um, and they will be wanting different things. But I've noticed is the when you're dealing with language design, when people say, oh, I would love this in a language, you have to ask, is that really what they would like? Because they don't, most people don't, this may sound like a weird thing to say, most people don't actually know what they want. Oh, sorry. Most people don't know what they need, but what they say they want doesn't actually match what they need. That's being careful. Because the old phrase is, if you ask someone um, what they wanted, they would ask for a better horse, which is the model, like the Henry Ford thing, rather than a car. And like they'll just ask for a faster horse or a bigger horse or something like that. And um, it's because like actually what they needed was a car. This was better. This allowed for multiple people and it was more efficient. It was smaller, easier to take. Thing. You don't have to clean it up, feed it. You just give it petrol and it works. Um, and you can go for longer distances you can go faster, everything. Um, in that case, it's like, yeah, but people wanted a faster horse. Like, yes, but you have to understand is what actually was the thing that they needed and implement that. Because people aren't wrong. When they say, I would love this in a language, they're saying, yes, there's a problem and this is what they want. Now, sometimes they just want sugar. Like, I'm not joking. People just want sugar. Like, I just want to save typing. And that's another thing you've got to worry about. And this is all related to vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. about And it's all to do with 
sugar. Yes, the devil's work, as someone said earlier on the stream. And it's the question of, is sugar a good thing? Sugar is actually very good for vertical scaling. But guess what? It's dreadful. So that's, yay, smiley face. Uh, for horizontal scaling, so good other te code teams. Um, it's not good at all. Now the question is, why am I saying it's not good for horizontal scaling with sugar? And it's very simple. More sugar, yeah, optimizes for typing, usually on average. Not reading. Uh, let's make that clear. And notice there's a difference here. So because sugar optimizes for typing, this is what many people say, I want to reduce the amount of typing I have. I don't want to have to do that. Like, it makes it harder to read. Now, this is not always true. Some sugar is actually easier to read than type. Um, sometimes it's easier for reading than, and typing, but usually you're doing for optimizing for typing. And most of the time, you're not writing code. You're reading code. And I'm not joking. I'm saying this. Most programming is reading code. And I, I think that's something that when people seem to forget when you're dealing with like multiple teams, because if you need to read other people's code, you need it to be more generally more less complex or simplex. Um, but you also you want to be more conventional, of course. And you also don't want to have to rely on many sugar, like many syntax, like these become dialects, like sugars become dialects. And many people prefer different sugars, even though it like, oh, juices the typing, makes it clean and more elegant. It's like, it's harder to read now. Well done. Like usually in practice, that's the case for most language constructs. Um, not always, but I can think of many ex ex exceptions, but that's kind of the problem. And yeah, and you're right. Um, so I'm just reading the comments. So something that comes in send again. Um, as a systems programming language, it's kind of a good thing that you have many people who are experts, yes, because you get direct feedback from people who walk the walk. You're right. You're getting some people who know are in the field. Yes, going stuff. Um, and yeah, you're right. So again, someone's saying again, like, yeah, it's correct that you ought to say what they're, they're already using. The trick is to figure out um, their original use case and the appropriate construct. That's correct. You have to understand what is their problem they're actually trying to solve and find the actual solution they want, not their proposed hypothesis of what the solution is. Find the actual solution. Because again, it's what people think the solution is and not necessarily always the case. Or it may be a solution for them. Okay, it scales well for them, but it doesn't work for other people because it may be too specific because there's the pro balancing that you get. You can be extremely specific with the problem and then it doesn't really work and you're going to have to mute things. Or you've got the problem now, you've got to have to be too general and it's not really useful for anyone. So you've got the problem, is it too specific or too general? And it's not useful to anyone on those streams and you've got to find somewhere in the middle. They've got to find that lovely golden mean for that problem. It's, again, it's not always easy. Um... <clears throat> And again, you're coming back to the faster horses. When someone describes the problem they want to solve to me, like Bill, um, I have luckily I have a community that has some thought into what the actual problem is. And then I can still say, sure, but we can have it black or black. And I'm like, yeah, and that sometimes I have to be opinionated because this goes to another principle of design is <clears throat> another principle of design, which is uh, striving for, not necessarily striving for one way to do things. Uh, choice can be bad. Now this is not obvious, and like most people think like, hey, if you get loads of people choice, isn't that a really good thing? Like, let people have the freedom to choose what they want. Um, but this is the thing is like, yeah, but if there's multiple different ways of doing things, then everyone on your team is probably going to do every single version of it. And then it's going to be, okay, this is a bit more, less unconventional again. So it's, it's having less thing. It's reducing the convent, is making it more conventional. And it's defining what's going on. 
And it's a very interesting kind of like thing. Like uh, sometimes you have to have multiple ways. Like I'm not joking. In Odin, there was multiple ways of doing things. Um, and that's usually due to the result of multi two different conventions literally conflicting with each other. And because those conventions are in confliction, it's like you kind of just have to have both of them. Like th there are sometimes there are contradictions because of general people's conceived conceptions of things like general other conventions and yes they may not be sometimes sometimes you can resolve those conflicts but sometimes you cannot and if you cannot resolve them then you can pretty much have to have multiple but that's the case and it's usually more specialized case it's very difficult so going back to it yes um, you're right so 50 percent of reading is just navigation you're right so if you're being very unconventional very dialect uh, like dialects everywhere or um you're being very uh, sugary, effective, that's why you're using sugar, then it's harder to navigate the code usually. Yes, you know what it means, and yes, maybe if you had a small team, they all know what it is. But as soon as you start trying to scale horizontally, get bigger and bigger teams, more people on the teams, more working on the code base, then it gets harder to deal with. And it is it's going to be true. Like Most people have dealt with this like, Yes, what's this little like one line like magic doing? And it's like, uh, oh, we know, uh, oh, oh, John, he knows what he wrote. He wrote it. He knows what it means. It's like, but is anyone? Like, nope, nope. But it does the job. We know what it does. Like, see what the problem is. Then you've got a management problem. You've got managing code. Like, someone knows what's really going on this one, yeah. And, and again, people saying 90% of programming is understanding the problem and coming up with the description of variable names. <laughs> yeah, naming things is hard. Um, and the other 90% is reading what you wrote. Yeah, so the last of that is, um, yes. And it's not actually, writing is not the bottleneck. Now, the problem is, this is again a balancing act, you could be extremely verbose. You could literally write as if it was um, Fortran everywhere. But Fortran is a bit verbose. It's not actually that terse. But the thing is, you can be verbose, but it may not add much. Yes, it may help with your reading, and that's argument with the reading thing. But the problem is, you've still got a program in it. And if you're having to richly write things everywhere, you've got... Uh, redundancy everywhere and redundancy means you're going to have more likely to have books so that's the problem you've got balancing act so you've got readability uh, ability but you also have um uh versus uh redundancy and you've got this balancing act of making it reducing the redundancy in the code versus actually trying to make it readable. And there's again, you've got another problem. These things are conflicting in there. The different qualities, which are not orthogonal to themselves, unfortunately, they all they kind of get into each other. And you've got to worry about how they mesh. Now it's a very interesting, again, very interesting thing to do. Sometimes I can tell you, oh, this thing conflicted with this thing. Like for instance, in Odin's um let's just say the declaration syntax in general uh, the value ways is different for how it like for instance um import declarations or foreign declarations work they use a keyword to start off their declaration but everything with values or names so it's like why are they different so well conceptually they are different like value declarations are very different to an import declaration effectively import declarations are only allowed at file scope um they actually have a different syntax like the, like the semantics are completely different you could you, you could unify them make them act as a value but i didn't because i wanted to separate the concept again it's related to the package like namespaces and type procedure like other type things like which other value like namespaces i'll call them um because they are different things and it's very interesting the balance you get with the different things okay so more the oh, it's loads of comments tonight it's lovely um so Yes, good navigation is very important. So it's very, it's very important. Let's try to do that with Odin. It's again, with the package system, that's why I settled on like the package as a directory because you want to be able to organize your packages into separate files um, and have the, the language defined. Actually, this is these collection of files means it's a single unit and they can all see each other. You don't have to worry about cyclic imports anymore. And you also have things organized. And that helps with the code navigation because you can set things into different files for navigation, even if this directory is organizing things. So yeah, this is the thing about readability and organ it's all related, clearly. It's all to help the, the programmer. It's not to help the computer. Um, now, another thing says, what matter is whether code helps you, you get your stuff done um, and or waste your time writing code like a book? It takes longer to write, longer to read. Um, and you're right. So the less I write, the more concise I am and the easier to read my code. Now, that's the problem. It's a balancing act. Because being concise can mean dense. And if you're really dense in your conciseness, it's really difficult. Now, 
again, Kalimi kind of makes a very good joke, but there's a spectrum. You have to make a spectrum. Like, Pearl is very concise, but it's right on a code. I am not even joking. This is not exaggeration. When I try and read Pearl, I get a headache. I am not joking. Pearl is... It's 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 just a bad language. I'm sorry. It's a bad language. Um, and it... it it is was pretty much one of the first ever uh, interpreted languages that was used for like had all like the regex and everything in it, but it was it was it's just a pain in the ass to read. So being terse is very useful, and I understand why people want to be terse, but it can be very dense. You have this balancing act of trying to be readable but not being too dense and not being too ter- terse, and it's really difficult. Um, and you've also got about other aspects of like refactability to worry about. You've also got other people. Like, yeah, if you are the only developer, it doesn't matter how you program, pretty much. If you're the only person you've got to worry about, your style is your style. If it works for you, it works for you. The problem is when you have to worry about, again, that's vertical scaling. The problem is horizontal scaling when you're dealing with all of these different people. And it's it's, it's a an interesting problem. Like, how do you do it? And and it is difficult. Another thing also sort of could could point out to remember is that sometimes vertical you can uh, vertical scaling be, can become horizontal scaling just with time, because you may think there's no multiple people, but yeah, your future self and your past self are, can usually be very different people. There's loads of times when I've written code when I went, "Who the hell wrote this?" And I'm like, "Oh, it was me." I'm like, "Yeah, past bill was awful." Or sometimes like, "Who wrote this?" That pastor Bill was wonderful. He knew exactly what I was going to be doing. And there's the thing is, like, you sometimes you're treating your past self or your future self as different people. In a sense, they are, because it's not you right now in the present. But it's also because they had different conceptions, the different knowledge they'll have, um, and uh, these different aspects of you. Even though there's a continuum of you, yes, there's the essence of you that's gone through time, but it is more of like they are kind of separate people because they have different... They are different in that sense. And you have to worry about you are programming not just for you now, but for you in the future. And you also, if, if you, even if it's just you on the single team, and you have to remember that. Yes, you can probably remember how you're doing it, but like if you wrote a project, came back to it 20 years later, like, oh, I forgot all of this stuff. Like, yeah, but you will forget things. So you always have to remember that. That's a very important thing. And it's many people seem to, to forget. Um, I include myself sometimes, but uh, I'm less so nowadays, luckily. Um, and you're right, so that some, someone's saying here is the number one worst thing for readability, navigation, readability, is templatized names. Um, you're right, so the word sem- semantic compression is coming up again, is, is all well and good, but not for the words people search for. And yeah, it's right, so you have to, naming is actually a really hard problem. I'm not even joking, like people think is um, uh, naming... things is hard and this isn't just related to programming it's it's everything <laughs> like you can name something but then you're trying you're trying to capture the essence of what that thing is in a short word and unless it's just and again if it's a new word and a new concept then yeah if you use a new concept you can have a new word to it, it doesn't have to have a relation to anything else necessarily but if it's a normal concept then you've got related concepts or already have words to them so you're having this battling thing so you can be trying to be terse with your naming convention but then you're, it's going to be hard you can always be verbose but then it's you've got too much redundancy going on and it's very difficult when you're doing this and again it's, it's hard it's a hard problem you have to worry about like how do you in the past, the future, present, like how you're going to deal with things, how you're going to search for things, how you understand it. Um, then also other people on the team, like, hey, do you want to be just like write out the word in full, or do you want to have a short mnemonic, or do you want to just have a general like sh- shortening? Like for instance, everyone uses the word mutex rather than saying mutual exclusion lock, like, mutual exclusion lock. Like, I'm not writing that out. Everyone knows what a mutex is. It's a convention based on the culture. And people understand what that means. But you may not want to write just the word L when you actually, for the, for the like for the procedure, when you actually wanted mutex lock, like and mutex unlock, instead of just L and U. Like, yeah, that's a bit too short. Yes, it's nice and terse and you know what it means, but not everybody else does. And sometimes even just writing the word lock and unlock may not be clear enough. Like you may need to actually say no, if you haven't got methods, obviously it showed and doesn't, you may need a prefix with like, no, no, it's a mutex lock and then a mutex unlock. 
Um, and, and that's sometimes the difference. It's the problem with overloading as well. It's a very... Yes, it makes things terse, and sometimes overloading is very, very useful, especially for refactability things, and also unifying concepts under one th name. Obviously, that's where it's all related. Um, but it's not necessarily <sighs> useful to read, because sometimes, from a readability standpoint, it can be magic. And that's the problem with overloading in general, especially with operator loading. It is not read readable as what is actually going on. And sometimes just having the explicit call... Um, rather than the um, implicit one from the overloading, like procedure groups in Odin, is better. And uh, usually o uh, o o the use case for overloading in Odin, like procedure groups in general, is for very generic things, where they have it something you know, like make is a good example. Like make is a unified construct, and it differentiates based on whatever the first parameter type is, like type of the parameter. Like it's, it's a type parameter. It's a, parameter you pass as, it's a type that you pass as a parameter. And that's how it differentiates. But then you have different differentiation by what parameters are passed. Like for instance, if I did, it, like in Odin, if I do make slice, like let's just do yellow again. Well, I've seen white this time. Why not? I'm just doing different colors. Um, if we do make and we do slice, um, and I'm just going to call it T, then I require a parameter there, ignoring the make things. But if I did a make uh, dynamic, oof, uh, there's different parameters that I can do. There's none of the, none at all. Uh, there is you can put the length in there, or you can put the length and the capacity. Like these are different differentiations, but they have all different have semantics. This will just do zero length, but a default capacity. This will set the length and the capacity the same. This one will have the length and the capacity set differently. So they are like you've got the different um, conventions going on, but it's usually very very obvious what's the case is, but not always. Um, and that's just being it's a very difficult problem like this is all related to conventionality this is the whole point of this like this is what I wanted this talk to be and it's, it's, it's a balancing act and it's really difficult because you have to assume what people your audience you're working with your platforms you're dealing on um, what you're assuming what you cannot assume what you do it's it's a fun act of design and it, many people don't realise how if you want to do well to design I'm not saying I'm brilliant I'm just saying it's a difficult problem and Again, when I was designing Odin initially, Odin was only meant for myself, my own needs. But it very much like, oh, I want to try this out. I'll try this out. Okay, I'll show it. And then I did the development. Multiple people, many people tried it out, keep doing it. And now to the point where I'm literally using Odin in my job every day, working, at Jang working with Jangra FX on Embergen. Like Embergen is written in Odin. It's kind of like, okay, now we've got a team where the team is now, oh, it's over 10 people now. Like the entire, like, oh goodness. And how many of them are writing Odin? Um, seven? Seven people? <laughs> so that's seven people using Odin. And it's like, oh, oh, oh great. Um, so now you have to worry about how different things in. Um, and it's very interesting. It's like, okay, so you've got now, again, yeah, I've had to already, luckily, I've had, no, luckily I had in the past, I was worrying about horizontal scale. And luckily, everyone on the team has seen to be able to, they, picked it up very quickly and easily because it was very conventional and it was very it didn't go against what they were used to and how they wanted to program anyway like many of them were used to c++ so how they program in c++ this was different ways of doing odin it's like well the way that odin does it is even better but the default is better and it's easier to deal with and it's like okay I, they could easily get into that stretch thinking it didn't have to change the way they think it's just okay compared to procedural programming maybe with some generics in there with the packages as well okay great we've got all these different things and it was done like, okay, great. You got the on take. Like, I'm not joking. People learned, like, had one person joined the team. He learned the language effectively in a week. Like, in, like as then it was like programming as if there was no, no, it was used to it, which is wonderful to know. But language Odin is that easy to pick up. Like, you can actually, like, feel extremely confident in language in less than a week. In, like, less than a week. Um, but yeah, but that's some languages it takes a bit longer and then you can feel confident, but they may be more productive for you. It's very, it's a difficult thing to know. But yeah, and again, I'm going back and I'm just going to cover this again, but this is all to do with conventional, being conventional, and a bit, a bit in different senses, being conventional, like don't be go against pre-existing conventions, what the culture is defined, and then defining conventions like idioms in your language. So this I'm going to define as uh, culture, culture slash um, intuition, and then this is idioms, idiom constructs. They're all idiom constructs at the end of the day, but yes, I mean like these are the at the, the language level. 
And it's all about the horizontal scale, vertical scale. It's a very, very complicated problem. And there's all these uh, things you have to take into account when you're designing things. But it it is very difficult to wonder what, like, this is pretty much it. Like, way defining. So, okay, sorry, other people talked about. Um, if, if you're the only program that your future self would disagree with, that doesn't matter. Be like, yeah, you've got to worry about it. Um, so with John, so someone's saying John, but even John Plote in his last stream mentioned that he takes more than a day away from a project. He it takes a moment to swap mental context back in. So future self can be very near future self, and you have to write with that in mind as well. And never mind doing an optimization pass on something you wrote months ago. And I, yeah, it's completely true. Um, and. It is really hard to actually get that. That is a skill that it takes a long time to learn. It is not something you can probably be taught. And it's not something that it can be easily done. Again, it is very difficult to learn how to program for so it's readable and usable by others and maintainable by others. And those others can be your future self. So that okay we've got a good question so how far is the win32 stuff gone since last time also will you be using it at work um so the win32 stuff will be part of the core library by the way so that'll replace what thing so whatever yeah so we'll be, by default we'll be using it at work um i've been talking with uh johnny marler who's the uh, maintainer of the win32 json project so what he's doing is reading the WinMD files, converting them to JSON. So then all the languages can read the JSON because it's an easier format than WinMD and it's also got more, it's getting all the information out that's necessary. And then using that JSON thing to convert into your language. He wrote it originally, he's it, it written the ZIG once, the went through ZIG, so it reads the JSON files and do it. I've been speaking with him regarding a problem which is to do with cyclic imports. So many data types that are defined in there can actually have cross dependencies. So like cyclic dependencies, like, okay, this thing depends on this project, which this namespace, which depends on this namespace, which depends on the thing itself again. So you've got a bigger loop. He found out that uh, of the 28,000 types, which are in 32, yes, there's that many types, different types in the Win32 API, um, about, f I think it's 559 of them, which is about 2%. Um, 2% of them are inter do, do inter intermodule dependencies, which is in between their cycles, in the intermodule cycles going in there. So we were discussing what the best way of dealing with this, and I said to him, we both agreed on pretty much the idea, say, hey, if we can generate it and say, look, those intermodule um, cycle types, if we put all of them into a, all of them, which is only 559, there's not many of them, luckily, all of them into a separate package, which we can just call shared or core or whatever, with something, a name, doesn't matter, give it a name, doesn't matter. And then all the ones that did want those types can import the, this like root one, make alias of them for their particular namespace, their package, and then it'd be fine. This would solve the problem of cyclic. So Zig, the original one, have, Zig allows for cyclic imports, um, so it doesn't have this issue, but Odin doesn't, and for many good technical reasons, by the way, which just puts away, it's a problem with race conditions. It's the short answer. You, if you don't, you can actually have race conditions in your language if you have out of order evaluation. And uh, yeah, it's a mathematical thing. It's like, yeah, it's not because I've implemented it poorly. It's like, if you don't define it well, you're going to have race conditions. It's just something like, yeah, unfortunately, it's a big problem. Um yeah, something else. Yeah, but yeah, it's that's the thing. So I'm um, gonna speak. Keep going to email them again soon. See what the progress is because you already figured out like okay, what we're going to be doing. And I think that's the best way of dealing with things. Um, so we could probably have two different JSON files, like one that's got the base thing, which is the raw dump, which is what went in the Microsoft dump, and then the new dump, which is the one that has takes into account the cyclic imports. So it helps languages like Odin, but it also helps languages like Go or any other one language that doesn't have cyclic imports. Like, for instance, a NIM is another good language, just remember, that uh, doesn't allow cyclic imports. Um, so doing all this would help those languages out tremendously. It's just that um, it's kind of a coincidence that Zig allowed for it, so it didn't have any issue and didn't see it until I, literally, I'm not joking, the day I, it came out, I was like, oh, I'll try it, try and do what it can do. And then I went, oh, I found this problem. Like, oh, no, there was a problem. Um, does Zig have out-of-order declarations? Yes, it does. But what I mean is out-of-order evaluation coupled with 
um, many other things. But Zig is also lazy evaluated, which means that if it's not used, it doesn't even get evaluated, which, to be honest with you, I think it's really bad. Like, really bad. That means you've got code, which has not been type-checked, but it's a new code. It doesn't, the compiler doesn't complain. It's like, uh, I understand the benefits. I just think that about the disadvantages our way. But that's kind of being critical of languages. My personal view, like, ugh. Um, there's, there's many other reasons why Z can get away with it. But it's because Odin cannot be for other reasons. But it's it's because you're not comparing apples to apples here. You're it's comparing apples to bananas. It doesn't really make any sense. So saying one's bad and the other, it's not necessarily the true. It's very different. It's just different. So you have to understand why that's going the case. <clears throat> I'm just going to pour some more lemonade. It is very hot and humid in here, and I need another drink. I'm going through the third pint now of lemonade. Whoa, whoa. Yes, sorry, that's very get good, good um, clarity there, yes. What I mean by this is it's lazy evaluation, compile time, not at runtime like Haskell, which means it is, it's, it's lazy evaluation of type checking, like semantic checking at the compiler level. So it's not just to do with the out order de um, operations. It's got to do with three different things. Um, one of them is out of order declarations, coupled with conditional compilation, coupled with out of order evaluation. Those three things together, and not just that, uh, will have cause problems. So, you can have, if you, the, the way, uh, so the third thing, there's the thing that causes the problem is out of order evaluation. Now, what causes that is a good question. It's very simple. Let's say you pass your files in using threads. Now, threads are non-deterministic in this case. So, that means the, the order your threads get evaluated in, your files, in your, in your, in your, in your parser, um, will be out of order, which means the out order that they've been added into could be out in random order every time. So if you're just doing it whatever order the files in and evaluate that, you can then have theoretically have a race condition there because the, if your thing if your thing does depend on order, like you need to define an order of the evaluation, if it's different every time, you're going to have different evaluations. You're going to have a race condition there. If you then define it, like the easiest way is you sort all the files alphabetically and then do it, uh, technically evaluate them in order, you've got no more race conditions, effectively. You've not, because you define an order of evaluation, so you've got one of the three things that causes the problem is if you get rid of it. Zig technically is in order there, so it doesn't actually have um, necessarily an issue there. So even though it's out of order declarations, they are in order evaluation. So Zig doesn't have that third thing, even though it has conditional compilation. But those three things together cause the problem. So if you do do, yeah, do do, if you do allow for that, uh, yes, I'm a three year old, um, then you're going to have those issues. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not writing the math graph theory on live stream. It just be annoying people, and you can prove it by the way. It's not, it's actually a provable thing. Um, but yeah, I'm not doing it tonight, I'm too tired, and also it's quite dark and heavy. Oh, whatever. Actually, I can show you the simple, it's not a proof, but it's more of an it's like, um, let's just go over here for a second. The way of understanding what this problem is is, for instance, you have a graph here, yep, right. Um, let's say the graph. Well, say the graph is cyclic, which make it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's cyclic or not. But it doesn't matter. If I start from A and I evaluate the graph, it looks like this. But if I start from B, it looks like this. And like, oh, you start from C, like that. And then you try and have these uniquely identified. These should all be identical. But because you're evaluating them differently, if you hash to this, you're going to get one number. This will give you two, and this will give you three. And these are all differently unique. So oh, then you've got a different value going up. So. It's a very interesting thing what happens, and it's interesting how it occurs. Um, another thing is that why Odin doesn't allow psychic imports is actually a different reason. This is, has nothing to do, um, nothing at all to do with that problem. The second reason why Odin doesn't allow psychic imports is because you rarely actually want them. If you've got them, you've probably got a bug. And it's because if you keep a strict hierarchy, so a tree, I mean, a linear hierarchy, just a tree. There's no cyclic imports here. I'm going to graph anymore. So it's not, not long linear. It's just linear. It means you can easily decompose things and reuse things. If things are highly bundled together, effectively, you've got a, a mega, mega package. So, for instance, if you've got packages here, just keeping it simple with the graph, this thing imports that one, imports this one, imports uh, that one and that one. Very simple. 
So this means you can easily decompose it. You can take these off. No problem there. If you have something, I'm just going to draw the same nodes, but if this depends on this one, this depends on this one, this depends on this one, do that, do that, do that, do that, and that. Here, you can see each thing is independent, nothing happens. Well, this is technically one big one. And this one is an overlapping one here as well, which means technically what you've now got is one big one here. So actually, your graph can now be represented as um, this. So you've now got not necessarily, you thought you had one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven packages. You've actually got three. So this is, the, and this is may not sound like, a, oh, this is, oh, this is not uncommon. I'm like, no, no, no. This is what you're now treating them as. Like, okay, here's one, here's two. It's like, oh no, this is actually one big one. So you have now actually had to deal with a big loop with these different things. So that's one of the problems is like, once you allow for cyclic inputs, you have to be careful you're not tri tri tripping up on this problem, which actually does exist in Python. Now, Python allows for cyclic imports mainly because um, it cheats and it's interpreted and it does things value it's in order. So then it caches all the files and then it can actually just import what it's already cached so it doesn't actually worry. So it's a cheat. Z uh, Python gets around this. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So that's why I don't really like cyclic imports. It's actually because it becomes really hard to actually decompose stuff afterwards. Because now what you've effectively got here is three rather than seven. When actually this is what you wanted, and instead you got this. Uh, lang interpreted languages always cheat. Yes, they do. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed that they would have cheat? Um... See, now I was actually believe this. No, but it's not cheating. It's just... Um it can allow it to do that because it is the way it's been structured in Python. Um, and it's not because it's necessarily interpreted, but it is actually in this particular, just for Python it is, uh, not all languages theoretically. You can, you're right, it doesn't get around, you, know, it, you do can sometimes get cycling import errors, and you're right, yeah. Um, but it has, it can mitigate a lot of them. And a lot of the times, like, another issue with cyclic imports as well, you've got to remember, is why do people want cyclic imports? And I've explained this before in another, another previous stream and stuff like this. I'm, I'm probably over doubling my topics, so, hey, I'm running out of material. And my jokes are getting awful. It's more of that you've got to worry about, uh, is like, what are people doing? Like, it's very simple. Like, my explain is like, okay, if you've got a file and that's a namespace, effectively, the cyclic imports happens is when actually I've got a single package and you're wanting to have that across multiple files and they want to see everything in it so effectively you've got this problem so you want to say this thing it sees this and it sees this and they can all see each other and they can all see this because it's effectively one one package and that's the way to see cyclic imports now the problem is this is not always possible if you don't have cyclic imports in your language so this is um not necessarily what you need so the solution the ones with cyclic imports is, okay, let's say I've got two things, keep it simple. We need to have a master thing they all import from, and then the, whatever they share, they can see. So the things that they share, they need to put into another thing, right? Which is what I was talking about, like the 132 thing with the interdependent, inter, inter module things. The things that are into intermodule cycles, we can just put them into a master thing and then import from that. That's the solution to that problem. That's what we have to do for sometimes. And that's sometimes required. But sometimes that's not what you wanted because now you think, okay, these are actually, I wanted to treat this as a single unit. So that means I now need to have an import here. So they all kind of have to have this thing. So then this becomes the unit and you effectively have this kind of thing going on, which is really um, annoying. And I'll tell you this, because what you actually wanted was one single unit. Like, if, if, if you're not allowing cyclic imports, like, how do you get around this problem? How do you get the cross dependencies if you, you can only do this? Well, there's, Odin's approach is simpler. It says, well, actually, the package is a directory. So you have the directory at the top. It contains all of the files. So file 1, file 2, file 3. They can already see each other. It's just that the directory itself is the container. So it has this benefit already without having to have cyclic imports. This is usually the common approach where you want cyclic imports is so you want to structure it out. 
And if you just do this, it solves that problem. You get rid of this literally three level system and go back to the one level system is what you actually wanted. And it also removes the issue of this one level system actually is usually a two level system. Like usually you got cyclic imports, yeah? And they can all see each other like there's no tomorrow. But then you need another one which really kind of is the master one or that collates them together. Um, so really you've got technically a two system or you've got to have convention where you've got a, again, an outside convention, by the way. Notice this is a, um, a, a cultural convention rather than an, a language convention. You've got this worry of like, okay, it's either we've got to find one of these to be the thing you import and then it imports everything else. Or you have one of the thing which imports the thing that you want to import. So this could be one or two levels. Well, this is literally only one level and that solves it and flattens the hierarchy. And then you do have the other hierarchy to worry about, which is the imports but the actual packages themselves are flat. Another consequence is you've then got a completely flat um, higher, uh, things, there's no such thing as a sub package anymore. So you don't even have this problem popping up. Everything is just flat. So this is the kind of the solution that Odin came about with. Um, but more traditional languages, not traditional, but more file-based languages, I suspect file-based languages, will get either have to go into the cyclic stage and have to do this convention, or they'll have to do the hierarchy pure hierarchy stage and there's there's no other way around it but the thing is you already have this hierarchy from when things import so now you've got hierarchies of hierarchies and it gets fun so there you you've already got the three levels and now you've effectively gone to a fourth level uh, uh, like it's like a meta a meta level now it's like, oh great but this was the way it reduces that and it's not like saying hierarchies are bad they're not it's just that adding artificial hierarchies is not a good idea. And you're trying to make this stupid Aristotelian world, which will never exist. Um, because it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you're going to have all these issues. So hopefully that explains that problem. So this is all related. I, I've been trying to keep on topic with this talk. Hopefully this is very careful. It's completely unplanned, by the way. I mean, completely unplanned. Um that was just me talking about crap the other day. It was me actually, I was actually planning this earlier because I wanted to, to talk about it. Um, so I was already planning what I want to talk about. I just got to the end. Um, yes, Aristotle. Great. Just don't apply his work because you're doing a category. Or it's the wrong, you're doing, look, it's the wrong ontology. It doesn't exist. These objects on your machine don't exist. Oh, but the object in my hand, like my pen right now, does. So there you go. Ugh. Category error, everyone. Magic. Um, whatever. Okay, so hopefully this makes more sense, and I'm probably going to stop in a minute or two unless anyone's got more good questions, but this hopefully is making sense. Um, uh, because, again, I'll repeat it again. You can be conventional or non-conventional when it turns into a design. There are different types of conventionality. There is being similar to pre-existing conventions that people used to. This is general cultural idioms or intuitional idioms, like people like general in ish intuitions they have or instincts or heuristics. The other one is just defining conventions in the language or the, or the design itself, defining those idiomatic constructs. Um, the next things are the things between horizontal scale and vertical scale. Vertical scale is what most people know about, which is getting your code base and scaling up with size and going up where. But horizontal is when you're increasing your team size or the code base complexity. And we talk about, I was talking about this, how this relates to if you have increasing size, you want to reduce your complexity too. And if you've got small size, you can allow for higher complexity. So this is allowing how much complexity you're allowed depending on the code base size. And also team size as well. So this is both complex size and team size. And you want to be in this under like this kind of like concave curve. And you want to be in this area. Anyone under this area. If you're a low size, then you can afford to have high complex complexity. That doesn't mean you should. You should probably aim as low as you possibly can. Um, so And there's also another axis which you could probably have another curve on here as well. And then you've now got a lovely 3D thing, which I'm not trying to plot. But it's all the dependencies, which is the in things. That feeling where there's no semiotic analysis of programming. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, we should probably invent it properly. We'll do it properly. Do it properly, yeah. Um, all the things as principles of least surprise, which is related to uh, pre-existing conventions or heuristics or culture and stuff. But it's also knowing the basic logic of something and seeing how it flows and don't go against what people's flows. Like if it naturally flows in one way, go for it sometimes, unless you've got a good reason not to. Um, other ones I was talking about, declaration syntax. 
other things about conventions, like for instance, Odin defines an array. I'm going covering over very carefully, uh, quickly, not carefully. <laughs> Odin has a slice type, which is technically a defining construct of what an array references, which in C would only have a pointer and then say like a, an integer to represent that. Um, Odin also defines a pointer type, but the conventions in a pointer type is very different to the conventions in the C. In C, a pointer is effectively a... Um, uh, what do you do? In, in, a pointer can be treated as a pointer to a single value of a certain type, or it could be an array of values, or it could just be pointer to data which is typed, which is not the same as the first one. It's a slightly different semantic difference uh, because they're different mental models. Uh, but yeah, you can see that this is actually the same because actually pointers, the reason why they work is because of pointer arithmetic. So it has, C has a different convention to Odin, and Odin goes, no, we're going to simplify that convention, and actually because where you wanted it was from the slice. Odin also makes a convention with regards to strings. Even though they're internally the same as a byte, they are semantically different. And there's a reason why they've even got different semantics to them. One of the things I wanted to say is that um, as we were talking about them, strings are semantically different to bytes because um, by a slight array of bytes because they are representing text. Like an array of bytes could just be an array of numbers which are a byte in size. And you wouldn't be able to know that from reading unless you were defining a cultural convention. You would have to use something like Hungarian notation or something, or to find a new type which was an alias of that, just so you could see it. So actually if you're defining it, you already got back to the type. But if you're not doing that, if you're doing Hungarian notation, then it's like... Uh, like even C technically has a distinction of strings, like it has a char type, unsigned char, signed char, and char. And if you have a char pointer, then it's technically a string, that's the convention, and it's also the language understands that. Another thing I was talking about with strings is that many languages, like higher level languages, try and unify the concept of a string and a string builder, when they are actually semantically different things. And in practice, this is one of the things I've noticed. So strings, uh, again I'm covering all this very quickly for people who weren't here, um, strings in practice, I found, especially in loads of C code bases, are usually immutable things. And if they're non-mutable, it's because you're trying to make a string, you're building up a string, and once you build it up, you don't usually touch it ever again. Or, <clears throat> the other thing is that you just really don't usually assign to it. It's like it's a bytes buffer in the background. So it's anything that's like building a string up or doing a memory optimization in, in place copy, effectively. So that's the case where that means strings can be immutable. And that's why in Odin, like, you cannot index assign into an index of a string because they're immutable. That means you can have implementation benefits. So this means you can have... Um, Oh, what's the thing is you can have a lot of um, optimization. You can have string interning in there. You can do many optimizations because it's read-only memory you're assuming. Um, so you can actually do a lot of better things going on there. Another thing which I want to say is semantic information is that from the real uh, from the runtime type information, I can do print line X, and it will know how to format it correctly because it understands its text, so it needs to render it as text. It is making this an assumption. That it's UTF-8 text, which is the sum. This is the again the convention I assume in Odin. I think it's the best compromise to take because most people are writing in text editors. They're using assuming it's probably ASCII-like, so it's going to be UTF-8 is the best assumption. That's the reason why, and I'm assuming that for strings as well. Yes, sometimes that's not the case, but that's fine. If you do need that, you can go custom. But the default is the, the kind of thing. Now, some would argue you need formatting, and that's better uh, for printf and I personally would say yes, but that means you're now manualizing it and you don't, can't always rely on automatic. And if you're doing the same, you can't always rely on it. Another thing we're talking about is packages as a convention and defining what a package is and what the requirements are for what a package needs to be for it to be useful. And I came up with on the on the, pretty much on the fly these four these eight different packages. These are the primary aspects. There are secondary aspects and tertiary aspects as well. I only cover the primary. We don't really care about the secondary or the tertiary because they are more cause the actual problems of when you define certain ways. But for, for, yeah, packages really need to have a concept of, of a namespace. They need to have a, a well-defined interface, like how do you interface with this uh, this, names, this thing, this package. It has to have a concept of what our dependency is. Not just what it imports, but is it what it imports another package or, another, or some other namespace or like, okay, so how does it understand this dependency graph? Um, reusability means it means have to be easy to reuse these packages. Um, and also reuse the concept of a package for something else. You have to have a worry about organization and how that relates to how you organize your code. That's why packages are there, but it's also organization with the file system and other things in general. Containment is the whole point. It's like how you're containing all of these entities inside this package, which is similar to organization and namespaces, but containment is also how do you store what a package is? Is it, It's relating to the file system. 
The other one is versioning, um, which is like you need to worry about what is the version of a package. Like it's got an has it got an identity, yes, but what version of that identity is it? Like is it the one from 2015 or is it the one of 2016? They'll be very different. They'll have different stuff in it, and people and that's related to the dependencies. And the last one is structure. Like how do you structure these packages? How they how, are they very hierarchical? They allow for imports. Many other things like this. And if, and it's all I'm saying is if that for me is that all of these categories have to be defined at the language level if you want a well-defined package and it's like something related like package managers you've got the issue of cyclic uh, no, uh, sorry the issues of defining a package manager because package managers many people ask like kind of get annoyed it is it they are trivial things they are literally three tables in a database and they're only a three tables in a database if all of these are well defined at the language level if you are defining them at the tooling level like in your package manager then your package manager is not going to come com complicated because you're now relying upon the conventions that the culture of that language is using and there's the problem so modern languages nowadays rust is fine for this go is now finally has a well defined package um, so it's absolutely fine. Rust has it; is pretty much well defined. I mean, it's it's semi defined, but it's good enough because pretty much Cargo is the language <laughs> language package system. Um, Odin isn't ready yet for this because Odin doesn't have versioning ideas, which means it doesn't complete the dependencies. But once it does, it does. So I would need to add the versioning metadata, which I know how to do. It's pretty damn simple. Um, I just need a separate metadata file which has all the metadata in it. And then you have versioning. Um, there will be one issue with Odin's approach, which is all to do with the ABI, but that's pretty simple if you have something like Odin thumped in the end, so that's not a problem. Um, so that's packages and conventions. Other thing I was talking about was the idiomatic constructs, so I'm covering this again. And talking about where do you define the idiomatic constructs? Do you find them at the language level? Do you find them at the core library level? Do you find them at the tooling or ecosystem level? Or do you find them at the culture? If you define them lower down, like this is the library level, like the more foundational thing, you have to be more opinionated. Now, it can be for better or for worse. Like, for instance, I'm being opinionated that Odin has a string type. Yes, you could use a byte slice and then use the operations, but in my opinion, this is my opinion, is then you're kind of defeating the point of a type system anymore, and you're going more towards a set theory system rather than a type system, so you're becoming more assembly-like rather than, again, a more higher level language in a sense. So, and again, this, there, there are different semantic information about what a string is compared to a byte slice. So I'm being opinionated there, but you can be also be really opinionated, like for instance, like Rust has an opinion, an opinion about how you ought to be programmed, to ought to be its conception of what safety is. And for better or for worse, that is defined at the language level, and it's very opinionated. You could always define it lower down, and then you get less and less opinionated until you get the cultural level, where if it's defined at the culture, then clearly anyone can have their own opinion and then have their own idiom, and it's not very opinionated anymore. But the problem is, is once you go from down this list here, it gets harder and harder to enforce. Hard and enforced enforcement here. So you have this idiom at the language that was really easy to enforce because the compiler will go, nope, 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 don't do any of that. Don't, we don't allow it. But if you're at the culture, it's like, eh, when well, everything, anything goes. Now, this also relates to other things like if there's a common idiom that the culture has, and it does seem to be extremely useful as well, it might be good just to enforce it and add it in the language level anyway. Even if people are used to doing it, just enforce it there. And even though you may say, oh, it's a better way of doing things, it's like, if it's good enough, like, really, like, and the, your approach is only slightly better and it's not really worth it, then just do what the general culture is doing. And that's not necessarily the best argument for design, but you have to understand that, yes, if everyone's, if, if it's really popular in the culture, it may be really good. So the kind of the wisdom of the crowd here has a decent opinion. And you think just encode it and then you can easily enforce it. You don't have to worry about anything else. But again, it's depending on where you put it, because sometimes you want it in the core library. But sometimes you want to know it's in the language and you don't know what it's, it's difficult to know where to do it. Like a good example of where the tooling system happens is, for instance, like for white space indentation enforcement. At Odin, I am not enforcing, I'm not being that opinionated if you use spaces or tabs for indentation. I really don't care. Now, if you want your code base to be consistent, something like Odin Fumped, when that is properly robust and I will properly release it, hopefully by the next release of Odin, which will be at July the 1st, obviously. Um, that'll be complete robust and everyone can use it but that'll be a good place where you can force it yes it's now harder because now it's harder to enforce because not everyone's going to be using odin fumped but 
in big code bases, people say, okay, this is really good. We'll use it in our projects and anytime they commit, we can do this. So that's now a cultural thing, enforcing a tooling thing for the construct for the language. So it's a bit of a like, uh, tiered thing, but it is still something you can do. That's very interesting. Another thing I was talking about was um, regarding sugar. So sugar is um, usually when people say, is it's great for vertical scaling because you, individual it's very easy you can easily make write more things more tersely but it's hard to think or it's hard for um, it's uh, worse for horizontal scaling because you're writing more things tersely and now you've got a dialect and people don't always know what's going on so again sugar optimizes for typing on average of course but not for reading and when you're most of the time programming is reading code it's not typing code you're reading code most of the time so you need to understand that if you have got not, and this is relating to there's many people on your team, but even if you're the only sole programmer, your past self and your future self are effectively different people. Even if it was yesterday, Bill, or future Bill, like tomorrow, Bill, they are effectively different people. They have, and you'll have to treat them. And remember, being clever with your sugar can be a hell of a lot harder. And yes, some people say, yes, but I don't want to type as much. And actually, if I have to write more, write more it's going to be harder to read might have to read more like but that's the thing is reading more is not actually harder necessarily and that was another thing i was talking about was redundancy which was here so readability and redundancy because it's usually a good way to have one way to do things because choices can be very bad thing you think oh choice is a great thing not in this particular case and it's very difficult with all of this when you're dealing with all these problems because you've got to deal with like people choose things and there's multiple ways of doing things that means there's multiple again everyone's going to be doing it eventually every other way and that means it's going to be harder to read and also harder to maintain because there's things sometimes you cannot like sometimes you have to have multiple ways of doing things because you have two idioms which conflict and they cannot be merged Sometimes you can merge them, but because they're already well established, you cannot merge them, so you have to keep them anyway. So you have this problem of one is a le problem of legacy, which is the last problem I said, and the other one is a problem of literally they are contradictory, um, or not they can't be unified is a better way of saying. Um, and that really been saying. And the other thing I said is yeah, naming things is hard because when you're dealing with readability, you've got to worry about naming. And then I was talking about procedural thing. And it's like, yeah, so that's pretty much. And then we're talking about uh, explaining the details of like cyclic imports there. I hope that's a good summary for people, um, for people especially right here at the beginning and near the end. So hopefully this is a lot more clear what today's little talk I was talking about was. Talk, 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 talk. See another one uh, Clayman said. Another, yes, another um, slicing. Okay, I'll read it from here. Sli uh, slicing, Odin slices can be faster than just incrementing a pointer or keeping indices around that you keep. Increasing. There's more semantic information for the compiler to use for optimization hits. This is absolutely correct. Um, the reason why this would be true is because now you know the data range of this pointer. And because you know the range, you can know if. Um, where the indices are safe, you can know if you can do there's many different optimizations. So even though the hypothetically they're exactly the same operation, what you're doing, and but even though they're hypothetically the same operation, it's because it's the compiler can now has more semantic information on them for the slice than just a point or an integer. They know they're associated. They can do much more optimizations. Again, another uh, downside of the printf is that now you have to pass the format string. You're correct. But if you're just doing uh, runtime hyper information stuff, formatting, it can be easily opt optimized more easily um, if the compiler sees you're uh, passing it as a given type without having to implement a compile time format string pass. And you're right, yeah. Um, because it can, you can, if you're doing printf like optimizations there, you, many compilers actually do that in C. So you can figure out, it'll read the pass string and figure out, oh, you do it formatting correctly or whatever. In Odin, it doesn't need that really. Um, you'll still be compile time, but you can do it there. But if you're not doing a format string, it doesn't need to do it. And it sounds like obvious. Like if you don't have a format string, you don't need to pass it to check if it's correct. Like I know that's obvious, but it says a lot. Um, yeah. So I hope everyone and was enjoying the stream tonight. I'm going to end in about two or three minutes time. Um, if you've got any more questions, please, please say. Um, because I probably just need to go to bed soon, even though it's red hot. <laughs>
Yeah, I hope that you hear the last bit, and I was hopefully covering what I kind of talked about during the thing. This is, I could honestly turn this into a presentation. It'd be a big presentation. I could probably split it into two things. Like, I don't really need to talk about packages effectively. Um, I wouldn't need to talk about, um, like, the declaration syntax I was talking about. But in general, you could. And this, apply, these, this kind of idea is applied to many different languages. But, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Hopefully this is oh, honestly okay for people. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, another question. Do you feel that Odin's context system is a form of opinionation, like how um, Rust has its opinion on memory safety, though Odin is much less in your face? It is an aspect of, of opinionated, yes, but it is more of there as a compromise of dealing with like how people deal with code already, and I know how people deal with code, and the whole point is there is a third-party interception. Um, so that's kind of the whole point of, context, of the context system. It is got an opinion because that's how it's this idea of like, hey, we've got this idea that there's a default context allocator you want to use or context logger or context de uh, temp allocator or whatever. And like, this is what you should be defaulting to. Like, it's nudging you that way, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it enforces it. So it's more of a, this is more technically a more close, closer to a nudge than it is a um, enforcement, if that makes sense to people. So it says, again, it's this dealing with, like, again, a lot of the design, again, I could talk about another thing, is nudging the programmer to do the, the, the non-crap thing. Not the good thing, just the non-crap thing. That's a lot of the design of Odin. <laughs> I'm not even joking. A lot of the design stuff was like, how can I nudge the programmer to um, not do the crap thing? And hopefully, that's it. Not saying do the good thing, because I'm not saying there is a good thing, just not a crap thing. You would like to see context.profile as well. I don't think that actually works well. I know, because um, I'll explain why. So I've actually, I've written, a, I've written profiles for Odin already. Um, nothing public, unfortunately. Um, but the way I've done it is I've heavily relied on global um, memory, because, it, but it has to, to be honest with you, because having it context-based doesn't always work, because not every procedure I want to profile actually has a context, because um, I'm using like C code and I'm having to do that. Um, so that's one issue but also the second issue is um, you kind of want it to be global information anyway because you need everywhere to access it from and it's all the same memory and, and it's all completely it's also complete thread safe as well I was doing but yeah because I just effectively have an event queue and I have two different event queues that can flip between each frame and yeah it's very simple it's very simple but it's completely like oh it's atomic push 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 no locks needed therefore it's just damn cheap and I pre-allocate the entire message queue is the distinction between a slice and a dynamic slice worth? Yes. So the reason why Go doesn't have this distinction is because it has garbage collection. In Odin, a slice is just a pointer and a length. A dynamic slice in Odin, a dynamic array in Odin, is a pointer, a length, a capacity, and an allocator. So because it has all of these, it has one of them only has two aspects, the other one now has four components to it. They are different. So... A slice is just an array of references. It's a window into an array, effectively, is the way I could think about it. Well, a dynamic array is it has a, a sl slice-like elements to it, but it also you can stretch into it. The way Go gets around it is that every Go slice actually got a pointer, a length, and a capacity to it. And it doesn't store an allocator because everything is just garbage collected, so it can rely upon that fact. That's why Go doesn't have it. Needs, you need to have a different way. But Odin does, because Odin is a lot more focused on m memory. So another question you have is, what um, other syntaxes have you considered for dereferencing? Uh, discriminated unions. While I absolutely love how Odin does it, the syntax has always seemed somewhat inconsistent to me in regards to the rest of the language. Yes, it's inconsistent on purpose. So this may sound bizarre, um, but the reason why is it looks weird is because it is meant not to be used that often. Even though, but it's clear that what it's doing is because it's distinct. It it's very different from the rest of the syntax. We could I could have tried and unified it, but it's not really a um, unification system on purpose, if that makes sense. So it's just different on purpose because then it looks distinct because it's a different operation to like a normal cast or a type conversion. Hopefully that makes sense.
Any more questions? Uh, I'll I'll definitely stop before one o'clock in the morning on my time. But um, any more minutes? Yeah. Look, again, this is one of us talking about thing. Is that a lot of the time is the syntax. You can always make if it's some that's a different construct, like a different idea, then you can have a different syntax for it as well. Like that's not actually jarring to most people when they they may not even notice it because it's completely conceptually different. Then you can have conceptually different syntax for it. Sometimes unifying it, even though you can, is not always a good idea. Um, unifying things does make things a lot more generic, allowing you to go more specific, like more domain specific and necessary. But that's not necessarily a good thing. How did you learn everything necessary to come up with Odin is now? I'm finding it difficult to work on your own language because I simply don't know what I don't know. Yes, yeah, so I have written many languages before Odin. Odin is not my first language. I should say that bluntly. I've probably made half a dozen or more, actually, before that. Um, so I recommend most people read, um, learn how to make like tokenizers and parsers and semantic checkers and learn how to lower, the, learn all that stuff. I usually recommend uh, Nicholas Vietz or Nicholas Wirth's books, um, how you, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Um, and like compiler construction is a very good one as well. I always recommend. I also recommend like data, data structures plus algorithms equals programs book is a good one because that shows you how to write a compiler for the language the book is written in. It's kind of a nice little bootstrapping trick, but it's also, it's a very simple language to read and also a real language to pass. So yeah, so I recommend that. But also all these other aspects that I've done here is a huge amount of research, a lot of trial and error, a lot of it is just talking to people, figuring out what they want, and also trying to get into the minds of other programmers and trying to figure out like, how are they thinking here? Like, what are they trying to do? Why are they doing this? Because sometimes you also have to think like, what they tell you again is not necessarily what they mean and like what they say they need isn't um, what they say what their need is isn't say it doesn't match up with their wants like I was talking about earlier like I was talking about um, um, if you ask people what they want they want a faster horse they don't want they won't ask for a car but when you ask them what's the problems they're trying to solve it's like well he, oh there's the problem now here's a better solution for it and that's what I mean, like some people don't, or people know what they need, but they don't know what they want. And there's the difference. They know they've got a problem. They don't know what the actual solution is. And their their rough approximation can help as a guide, really, when it comes to design. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. And the person as the language designer has to make those decisions. And it's very difficult, as you know, design is not an easy problem. Because it was easy, everyone would be a designer. In fact, there wouldn't be need for a designer. But... <clears throat> That's the problem with problems. That is a bit meta there. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question. And also another thing, sorry, about other language design is try as many languages as possible. I mean it. Like, don't just like, oh, I've, I've, I only know like, I only know C and Python, therefore I'm going to make a better language than C and Python. But yeah, like just just make as many languages as you possibly can. Like tr re read as many as you can, make as many as you can, understand why the decisions were made the way they were, understand the compromises, everything. Just read it, like understand it, research. This is not something like I don't honestly, I don't think there's an easy book out there already. It is something you can either have to have do an apprenticeship with someone who knows what they're doing, or you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. And figuring out yourself is going to take a long time. And also, if you're on apprenticeship, you have to be careful because they may be very, um, could be very academic, usually more likely, which means they'll be giving you more academic design for very functional like programming languages, but they may not be very good for your style, which may be imperative or um, such. And it may not be very good for your domain. So you have to very, again, it's very difficult. But I think that's a good end for the stream. It's been going on for now for two and three quarter hours. Bloody hell, it's a long time. So thank you for all for watching. And. Now that it's Thor's day, Odin day has ended. So, good night, everybody. It's been a wonderful stream. Thank you for all watching.